We will call the uh, 2022 budget workshop to order. Welcome everybody here on this beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, we have a lot to get through today. So um, Sarah is gonna have a full day in front of her along with Mike. Um, so please, if you do have comments, please make sure that they're concise and uh, we'll try to get here up, out of here on time or maybe even a little bit early today. Uh, do ask that you do speak up uh, just so those listening online can hear you as well as uh, administration. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good day. We'll be taking regular breaks. Um, so uh, we'll take a break around 10 o'clock and then at, once again at 11 before lunch. Um, if you do have a cell phone, please make sure it's turned off or on vibrate. And if you do need to take a call, please do so outside of chambers. And with that, we will hand things over to administration, CEO Beverage. Good morning, Mayor Sahara and Council. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to kick off the 2022 budget process, starting with this workshop. Not only are there some new faces around the council table, but there are also new faces in the senior leadership team. Aside from Sarah Bender, GM of Corporate Services, who has extensive experience and history with the support organization and the community, we are pleased to have her lead this exercise today. The rest of us, including myself, myself have recently joined the organization. We have two very new, not an experience, but with the organization, GMs. Bob Beck, GM of Community and Protective Services, Clayton Kittlitz, GM of Infrastructure and Planning. With this in mind, the previous appointed interim GMs, uh, Al Schramm and Pat Fisher, are here to provide the finer details of the budget, as required, of course. As expected, with all the new faces, there are many ideas flowing. Uh, there's a learning curve as we understand the organization and the community. Please be assured that we all are committed to help move the town of Edson forward as we are we get underway to discover this new council's vision and goals. The town of Edson, like many other municipalities across the province, is facing a great deal of financial challenge. To start, we have a substantial infrastructure deficit. We also continue to deal with COVID-19 and there are many impacts on our services. We are, we are recovering, but slowly. We're also faced with a reduction in grants and other revenues from the province, as well as reductions to find revenues to municipalities. And the future doesn't appear to be more promising as anticipated additional provincial cuts are on the horizon, as such as MSI for future years. The downloading by other levels of government, along with regulatory changes, have also seen increased costs. And we will articulate the impact clearly and transparently. With this in mind, administration worked diligently and responsibly to present ideas and options for the delivery of services for the coming year for the town. We hope the council considers the challenges that we are faced with in doing so. The goal of today's workshop is to introduce the draft budget, draft proposed budget, and allow a discussion on items the council wishes to take a deeper dive into. This will help administration as we move forward in the next steps in this process. With that, I will hand this over to uh, Sarah Bittner, GM of Corporate Services, and my passing Corporate Services Manager to lead Council through the Town of Edson 2022 draft proposed budget. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Beverage. Um, welcome, Council, to Budget 2022. Uh, just a, a, a slight uh, housekeeping <laughs> issue uh, with the barriers up. Um, sometimes I do have trouble hearing questions, so please don't be offended if I if I ask to repeat, or I may ask the mayor to uh, clarify for me. For some reason, I can always hear him. Um, I think it's the radio voice <laughs> that he uh, he brings to the table. Uh, all right, so moving on. So this just quick going through the schedule today. We'll start with the operating budget workshop. And we'll be presenting uh, a number of items uh, uh, for you today. This will do a quick summary of the citizen budget engagement tool that we uh, did through the summer. Uh, going through the next our pandemic recovery subsidization strategy. And we'll talk about municipal price index, NPI. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, we've talked about the utility rate increases that are um, proposed for the 2022. And there's an area about we have some revenues that offset our taxation that, that need to be addressed into the future. Uh, then we go into a salaries, wages, and benefits breakdown. We do this as a whole rather than per department. 
the departments can move, they can, uh, you know, we reallocate some wages or salaries throughout different years. So it's nice to look at them all as a whole. So you're looking at the whole picture for those. Then we move on to the departmental presentation. So each department has its own page, its own presentation. Uh, some are much smaller than others as we'll go through. Some have uh, some changes, some have uh, very little change, but we'll address each one as we go through. After each slide, I'll pause and uh, <coughs> uh, the council will have the opportunity to ask any questions on those. So the two columns of note, actually I've got, I'll go through with the sheets when we get there and I can explain the different columns to you before we go through the first sheet. That would probably be um, the easiest way to do that. And then we go over that, uh, we go move on to our capital budget workshop. So there's a listing today uh, that you saw in your, in your package there and in the agenda for the proposed capital projects and the proposed funding for those projects. And then also attached is a list of what the reserves would, might, might look like <laughs> at the end of 2022. So by the end of the day, um, administration generally likes to have a general idea of where council might like to fall as far as a taxation impact, um, and have an idea also of the of the uh, some of the projects that council would like to see in the capital budget. These will be brought back on November 25th to our special meeting in the form of our presentation budget and uh, for the last proposal for council there. Also coming to the November 25th meeting will be our three-year operational and five-year capital plans. These are a new requirement through the Municipal Government Act, the NGA, that uh, councils must review these once a year. Uh, they are in their the work in progress still for us. Uh, we um, have had many, many years of concentrating on just the next year. So it's a, it's a little bit of, of system focus and we're getting better and better every year at preparing three year plans and five year capital plans, but still we will always, always improve those as we go along. So you'll see those coming to you as well. We plan to do a change in timing of these. Uh, we're finding with having to do the budgets and having to do your three year plans at the same time of year is a little bit uh, daunting. So. Next year, you'll see these coming earlier in the year for, for council review, so we can split that um, workload up between the years. Oh, thank you. I'll move on to, I'm oh, sorry, I should ask any questions about the schedule today. <coughs> uh, so moving on. This year, we ran the citizen budget engagement tool uh, from June until July. In previous years, this had been but after this, this point in time in the year, and it was more an informational tool for the public asking, you know, well, would you expect more or less money on this particular area? Because it was focused on the dollars. Uh, we changed it this year, I think in, in, in future years to more of a, would you, like to, would you like to see the same level of service or a decrease or increase in a level of service in any given area? Uh, so this year we had 114 responses, which was up from, 85 the year before. Every year we seem to have gone up each time. Uh, we do send out notification on all the utility bills for this. Um, we um, put uh, adverts on social media, not just our page, goes in the paper. So we definitely try and get to reach everybody in the community that they have an opportunity to, to pop in and, and, and give their input into this. So let's see, for each area we ask, would you like to see a higher, lower, or the same level of service? And the summary for the results that we had. Um, these were the areas that we asked uh, information this year on whether the, uh, they would like higher, lower, or same level. So obviously the bolded percentages are the, the ones that had the uh, majority. Um, as you can see, for most of the areas, uh, the majority of the uh, I'm sorry, the majority fell within the, the uh, levels of service, the same category. Uh, the two that were outliers, uh, community development, the majority was a decrease. Um, still not quite 50% though, but it was a decrease. And again, for roads, it was an increase again, just shy of, of uh, the 50% mark there. So we just incorporated these in as a, uh, a, uh, a summary of what happened with that engagement tool. So does the council have any questions on this? Cool. 
So we'll move on to our pandemic, pandemic recovery subsidization strategy. So the 2021 budget was a return to normal levels of service and it began bridging the gap between the emergency budget that was our 2020 budget and the budgets going forward. There was a slight adjustment in spring that we did bring some of our revenues back down based on the fact that we had to close for the first two months of the year at Repsol. Uh, so the measures that we are using includes a what's called the Municipal Operating Support Transfer or the MOST grant that the province has that, that, uh, provided to municipalities to assist with the financial difficulties presented by COVID. We created a COVID relief reserve from some of the monies for, in our, um, from our original 2020 budget to our emergency budget. And last year, we also decreased the contribution to the energy reserve to bring the, um, the taxation level down from the, final, from the December budget to the spring budget. So the province provided us, well, the province provided the most to assist municipalities. I'm sure they picked that acronym so it sounded that way, but uh, provided the most to assist municipalities to deal with the financial difficulties presented. And they gave us approximately $850,000. And see by the, the, uh, the chart we have on the screen here, we used 340 of that to offset ta the taxation in 2021. And we were reducing that over the next few years um, until that, is, um, that has been used. Uh, the COVID relief, as I say, was funded by service level cuts in 2020 and set aside. And again, we used 144 of that in 2021, and we will be using uh, some of that going forward as well. And again, the energy reserve that we used last year uh, for the um, bringing down 0.9%. Uh, we will take, we're looking at taking three or four years to also recover from using that. Every time we use reserves to uh, lower the taxation rate, we must try and, and get those reserves back. It's gone. and if we don't do this in a slower way, there's a, a larger jump the next year to get back to the same level of service. So, uh, next, so these funds do come from sources that have finite balances. And so we, we can't use them in the medium to long term. So we've come up with a five -year, this five-year plan to remove our reliance on those subsidizations. So as you see each year, 2021 to 2022, we have reduced our reliance on, and we're still using some, $403,000. But that difference has to be brought back through taxation. So there's the 1.67% of taxation increase to um, mitigate the less use of that, those subsidizations. And going up to 2023, 24, and finally in 25 would be when we um, reduce our reliance on, on these at all. The most grant, the COVID relief grant, will be depleted. The energy reserve is replenished every year by the Fortis franchise fee. Uh, but I also know we're looking at doing more energy projects and putting that towards um, the, the intent of that reserve. So any questions on the pandemic recovery? forward. Now we get to Municipal Price Index, the MPI. Uh, so everyone on has heard of CPI, that's, that's Canada puts out the Consumer Price Index. So this looks at um, inflation for the consumer, so it includes things like food or clothing, that type of, those types of purchases. Uh, in recent years we've been looking into what's called the Municipal Price Index, which looks at the inflationary uh, effect on goods that municipalities purchase. Uh, we've uh, piggybacked on Edmonton's. They have their Department of Economists, I'm sure. So we've uh, we've uh, sort of piggybacked on using theirs. Uh, Edson's would probably be a little bit higher than Edmonton's, just based on the fact that we are out of the main centre. There would be maybe extra freight charges, things like that. Um, and uh, if We've learned anything from Facebook. We know our fuel prices are always higher than Edmonton's. Uh, it's sort of done, you see that every year. Uh, so those types of things would come into play into if, if we did our own MPI. So going through the graph, 
we have the dotted blue line at the top there was Edmonton's original MPI forecast. So that's the one that we were looking at and, and, and sort of gauging against. Uh, along came 2020. Now the solid blue line is their new forecast for MPI going forward. So as you said, it's dropped um, considerably, especially at the, at the, at the far, further end of the graph there. The solid green line is the town of Edson's um, actual reality, what we're doing with, with, our, with our taxes at this time. As uh, so you see in 2020, we had the big dip. That was when we actually removed between 5 and 6% from our taxation, bringing us down to where we are there. Uh, so you see and moving up. Um, so the dotted green line is where we would have been more or less probably without COVID to keep the same level of service that we've had. This is all about the same level of service at this stage. So you can see the difference between the, the solid green and the dotted green is really the subsidizations that we are using to help offset those. Uh, at the far end of the graph, you'll see the, the dotted green and the solid green actually meet. So this is what we, uh, we call our good news graph. This is actually good news if we're looking at this this way. Uh, that would mean that we have re re removed all our reliance on subsidizations. We're back at the same level of service that we had without subsidizations. And also now slightly above the MPI, which is where we would expect Edson to sit. Councillor Byer. Thanks. So through the chair to you, Ms. Bittner. So when you're mentioning in 2025 that we would be kind of off the subsidizations, are you just referring to the most the co most grant, the COVID relief grant and the energy and not the, the items later in the agenda that we'll, we'll get to? That is correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's just, just pandemic recovery okay. stage for this. Okay. Uh, so I think that was, uh, any other questions about the NPI? Thanks, Dr. Um, Chair, to Ms. Bittner. Um, so, with, uh, I'm not sure if you have this answer or not. Um, so, I, I found it a little interesting that Edmonton kind of reduced the uh, municipal price index um, from its traje trajectory when, um, and maybe this is just the consumer price index I'm thinking of, and I'm not correlating this properly, um, but it seems that many goods, uh, the cost of goods and services has actually increased. Um, since COVID, so I'm just wondering if there's any um, uh, reason for it that you were aware of why why they decreased the municipal price index. Thank you through the chair to council by it's a very good question. We had had some discussions on this as well. Uh, this is uh, this is the city of Edmonton doing this mm -hmm. for themselves. They do have a couple of areas where they have more control over some of their pricing than maybe we do. Okay. For example, they, they run their own police force, whereas we are uh, contracted out. Um, they, I believe, they also run their own fines program with the photo radar, etc. So they also have a little more control over those costs than we do. Um, I know they also have a, a, an interest in EPCOR, but I don't think they would have a, um, I wouldn't think they would have a lot of uh, control over the, the cost of electricity, but I, I don't know for, right, for sure. But so those are some areas where I think they would have that also have the chance to bring that down, whereas um, we wouldn't have that because we contract a lot of those things out. Okay. Thank you. Right, so move on to some of the, uh, the figures within this budget. So the 2022 budget today is presented with a 4.99 taxation increase to the base budget. The base budget is just the same service levels that we had last year. Uh, we do have some other items, additional budget requests, etc., cetera, um, brought forward today. And that actually takes that to a, a 7.74, including all of those additional budget requests. Uh, but we're concentrating on the 4.99 for now. The breakdown of that is shown in this table. You'll see in the, in the graph at the side. The green part of that graph is what we've called the obligations. And these are items within this budget 
where they have external influences. So there's very limited, um, there's, there's a limited amount that the town can do for these particular items. So you'll see we have the electricity is going up. Um, that's the, to the tune of around $109,000. Upper leasing contract is going up um, based on their new um, agreement. And this is just for 2020 uh, at the tune of $150,000. A photo radar contract, uh, it was the budget for 2021 had been based on some trends, and we did have a year in that trend that was very low. So this was inadvertently dropped in 2021, but to meet our contract obligations, we need to add uh, 75,000 back to that budgetary line. Uh, the wages are also led through our collective agreement with the union, so they are set uh, based on that agreement. And then we do have some other obligations, for example, insurance rates are going up. We've, uh, we don't know what they are exactly yet, but we've uh, uh, allowed for a percentage there. We have contracts that we've signed that go up each year, for example, our, our assessor or our auditor or those types of um, uh, consultants that we use. So all of those things that um, through contracts, etc., cetera, are also included in our obligations. So of the 4.99, that makes up 3.324% of that. Uh, I'll go through the whole lot and then I'll open up for the questions. Um, so the next part of, of the 4.99 is our decrease in subsidisations that we've spoken about. Uh, so the, the slowly reducing our reliance on that is uh, this year adding 1.673 of part of that 4.99. And then we have other or everything else that is, that is there is the we have our salaries and benefits at, uh, just shy of 1% there based on our uh, compensation policy that was passed earlier. And other budget correction and trends. So these are the parts of the budget where our managers have gone through, looked at things they may need, looked at their revenues, brought everything back to, to the, that, that, level, that level of service. Um, that's required for a normal year, which uh, we're expecting 2022 to be. So those together make up the 4.99%. Uh, so any questions on that? Councilor Warren. Uh, to the chair, through to Ms. Bittner. The policing, is that, uh, is that uh, taking into account the uh, increased wages for the RCMP? Through the chair to Councillor Moore, it is for 2022. This does not at this time address the retro, retroactive pay that may be still coming our way. So this is just the increase for the, the new rates for 2022. Thank you, Councillor Sharp. Hi, uh, through the, um, your 4.9 that we're predicting and we're taking out subsidies. So when we're looking back from last year, we were subsidizing five, so we we're actually eight or nine. So if we're taking away subsidies, what's going to happen next year? We'll have to go to seven or eight, or are we doing cost savings in the budget coming up? I threw the chair to Councillor Shrenat. Um, can we can maybe bring back the um run through this again. I may not have explained it. I was going to ask it then, but I thought it was pretty true. Yeah, this this table on the screen here, yes, this shows how we're slowly reducing those subsidies. So it's 1.6 this year, next mm -hmm. year it will be a one point. 0.98, the year after that at 1.4. So to do that, we're slowly reducing that reliance. If we weren't to do that and keep those subsidies in, there would be a year to get to that same level of service where there would be a large jump in taxation. Right, and that's so what I'm saying, because I look so up there at the most where we say 340, well, that's 3.4% tax and 2.5%, 1.7. So if it's 340,000 we're subsidizing, that's almost equal to 3%. So I added over here, you know, then we're looking at eight, eight and a half. And I, and I totally agree the last few years where we held taxes due to COVID, sooner or later, we got to pay back, you know, so that's where I was looking. So 4.9, if we can move ahead with that, that's a realistic number to make up for the shortfall for the previous year. So I just thought I'd point it out. Uh, more questions as we dig into it deeper. Thank you, Councillor Taylor and the Councillor Positioning. <clears throat> Through the chair to Ms. Bittner, uh, I noticed throughout 
the the budget I see you know increases in insurance is that um, are we dealing with one company for insurance or do different areas say policing or different areas deal with different insurance companies or different different types of insurance or things like that through the chair to council of Taylor, we actually uh, have our insurance through um, I'm going to use an acronym and I hopefully maybe Sarah Beveridge knows what this is for AMSC. So I know, uh, so, sorry, we got so used to some acronyms. It's actually a, a branch of the AUMA, the Alberta Urban Municipal Association, thank you. This is a branch of that. Uh, where all the, municip all the municipalities, all the municipalities that are using it, we pull together, so all our insurance is done as a pool. Uh, so that actually helps with, um, if, one, if one municipality has something happen one year, the recovery of that is spread over the, the entirety of the, the members of that uh, insurance. Thank you, Councillor Position. Thank you, Chair Ms. Bittner. Is it still the 1% tax increase generates about $100,000 still, or has it changed? Uh, through the Chair to uh, Councillor Position. At this time, 1% uh, uh, generates about $112,000 now. Yes. Our number is wrong. All right, thank you. Continue on. Moving on here, a little chat about uh, the asset management plan and how that um, affects our utility rates. So the asset management plan, or here I say AMP, was adopted by council and it recommended an increase in utility revenues for water and sewer of 1.2 oh, and 4.4 respectively annually for 20 years. And we did start this in 2020. And that's to cover future utility infrastructure needs. And while there's no tax implication, um, as we now move towards cost recovery with our utilities, uh, it does show a small increase in the utility bills year um, in, in, in each given year. But it does accumulate, so that's how we start building up those reserves. Uh, so we have put the proposed 2022 budget increases in the additional budget request section, you'll see as we go through. Um, and those revenues that we do generate from this, they put into specific asset management plan reserves for water and sewer. Uh, they were originally, we had to go to general infrastructure, but these are reserves that are specifically for water and sewer and future infrastructure needs. So we're going to keep them separate from our general infrastructure reserve. Um, just as an aside, they did also recommend adding 2.2 to the overall tax increase every year. Uh, to, um, to manage our other infrastructure needs. Uh, we don't address this directly at this stage. Um, we have a, a re recommend to focus on um, what's actually coming up on the next slide, our revenues offsetting taxation, um, as that would also help build our reserves as well as um, reducing our reliance on those operationally. So with our utility rate increases for this year, uh, so we do strive to operate on cost recovery models for our utilities. And so under this model, the operational cost, um, it becomes necessary to adjust the operational, um, sorry, operational costs make it necessary to adjust the rates to ensure that those, those extra costs are recovered. So that the uh, presented 2022 budget proposes a rate increases as you see on the screen as, as follows. Uh, so you see we have the 21 rate, the operational increase, this, these are in um, dollars per cubic metre. So it would be an uh, operational increase of 7 cents, the AMP increase for water would be 3 cents, bringing that to the 2022 rate of $1.31. Uh, and then you see on the far right the average annual increase to a bill based on 20 cubes per month, it's, uh, um, it's an average amount. And again, for sewer, uh, going forward, waste collection is a contract we have with an external company. Uh, so that's, we just, we need to increase those rates to recover the increase in that um, contract. Uh, stormwater is a relatively new addition to our utility bills. We're trying to, um, at the moment, storm is incorporated in, in our roads and transportation budget. And we're wanting to, um, recover some of those costs and also create start creating a storm budget we don't have enough information yet to do that 
but last year we removed some of the taxation and put it into the utility bill just to show that stormwater is part of our utilities that we need to address. And the recycling is also a contract with an external organisation. So overall for a residential house with an average use of 20 cubes per month, it would be a yearly increase of $65. And for non-res, it would be a yearly increase of 57. And this is because they do not pay for waste collection. That is only for residential. So any questions on that? No, Thanks. Through the chair to Ms. Bittner. Um, so I, um, I'm in favor of continuing that 2.2 and 4.4 as we have been. Um, I just want to make sure that my understanding of where that money is allocated and what the intention of those reserves are for. So when I, and I, I might be jumping ahead here, but yes, okay. I, I just want to understand it as, as it is. So I understand the operational increases as they are. When we have that asset management plan increase and, and we, um, I was just flipping to the capital reserve on that. Um, at what point would we take from those reserves? So is that uh, water asset, asset management plan reserve for um, the capital cost of drilling new wells? Or is that for if there's an issue as a residence house that would be above and beyond an operational expense? Um, can you just get a little bit clarity on, on kind of where that money will, will end up into the future? Certainly through the chair to Councillor Ryan. Uh, yes, this the intent for the uh, putting these increases on and putting them to a reserve is for the replacement, future replacement of the assets that were in the asset management plan at that time. So we're slowly building up those reserves. And you'll see when we do get to reserves, the, 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 they are listed in the capital reserves on page 88 uh, as two separate reserves. So you'll see those grow over the years. But this is to be used for the assets that were in the asset management plan at that time, I believe it was 2018 or 19, that um, this was brought in. Uh, so it, is, as it, it should be only for replacement of those assets in the future. Okay. Um, just a clarification, the, the last number, so the $2,400 for water, that's $2,400 per year to their bill, so two bucks a month, is that correct? Like on your last column where you yes. said, and so if you use an average amount, like you're saying, then your bill per year will go up $24 a year, correct? That's We've listed fine. them separately, but your bill entirely for all of the new utility rates would go yes. up $65 a year. Per year, okay. Yes. The other one I'm unclear on, and I'm, I'm going to ask it, recycling non-res, what is that? Through, oh, sorry, through the shared accounts for that. Uh, recycling depot is available to everybody in town. The uh, non-residential use it a lot for cardboard, okay. um, those types of things. So when we change to the, the uh, contract with the, the um, Edson Recycle Depot, uh, to recover those costs, we've now put that cost on um, basically every, every utility bill in town, because everybody has the opportunity to use the Recycle Depot. Um, I based the, the split between the, uh, I had some information from the manager at the Recycle Depot, and I based the split on uh, what was given to us based on what was a commercial volume versus residential volume. Okay. Yeah, I would just want a clarification. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Byer. Thanks, uh, through the chair to Ms. Bittner. On the stormwater, which we just recently we introduced that last year, um, I have in my notes that that um, $35,000 um, generated annually for every $1 on utility bill. So last year we would have generated $70,000. So if, if this is going into the operating budget for stormwater um, management, is that um, the required amount that we would normally um, need for annual maintenance, not the capital portion, because I believe that's separate, but is, is this considered full cost recovery or how far are we from that actual number? Through the chair to, to Councillor Byer. Uh, we are doing a, what we're doing now within our, our roads operational is tracking the cost for storm. Um, we've done, I think for maybe a year or two, but we'd like a little history on exactly what it does cost for the operational costs for storm. And then we would like to pull that out into its own area, its own little department. So you see roads and storm as a separate department. And then we can look at the cost recovery of that um, through, 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 the, through the utility bills if, if council so wish. 
Okay. Just a point of clarification. We'll go ahead, Councilor Position. That's more of a question on process, and it's to you. Um, this is a workshop. Um, we don't have motions on the table, and we're using through the chair, back the chair, and it's going to take a lot of extra time. Um, and you can maintain order without having to go through the chair. Absolutely. So it would be possible just to have a workshop. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just a point of clarification for the new members of council. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why we have, uh, we move stormwater out of taxation into utility bills is we have a number of properties in town that do not pay taxes, but still have to benefit from that service. So when you hear us talking about removing things out of taxation, putting them on utilities, is to ensure places like the provincial building and other assets in our community that are not currently paying taxes actually are contributing to the cost of delivering services in our community. Um, this one here in particular uh, came after the government decided they didn't want to pay taxes on the building. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Move on. Any further questions on the um, AMP or the utility rates? <laughs> move on to the area of revenues offsetting taxation. So we have um, five areas where we have revenues within our operating budget that are offsetting taxation. Um, the first three, especially, these are ones that if these revenues were to discontinue in any given year, we'd face a, a large increase in taxation to maintain that same level of service. Probably going to hear me say that quite a lot today. Um, those top three have external influences. These are things that um, could, could disappear, if you like, um, based on, on external uh, forces. The, the bottom two, number four and five, uh, sorry, water and uh, the ATCO are internal ones that we can address internally. Uh, so we're wanting to start removing our reliance on these revenues by slowly moving it back into taxation, but taking that amount of money and putting it to a reserve uh, so that it's, it doesn't just sort of disappear, it actually helps start building up some of our reserves. Uh, so as, as, we, as uh, we said earlier, 1% taxation gives us around 112,000. So looking at some of these, there would be, um, if, if the, uh, the amount for, say, the fines revenue was to disappear, that would be a 5.36% jump in taxation to maintain that same level of service that we, that we have been used to. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Can you just elaborate um, what fines you're talking about? Is this photo radar fines or is this um, fines uh, for bylaw enforcement? Um, just to have a kind of better picture of what that, what that looks like. <coughs> they are not certainly council uh, these are These are fines that, I was trying to think through my um, books here, hang on. Yes, this would be the, um, Fines uh, generated through photo radar. Uh, there would also be if, if the province were to change any of their, for example, with this one, uh, we used to, the province uh, decided to take more of our fines revenue away. And there was a couple of years ago, it might have been 21, I'm not exactly sure, mm -hmm. where we had to drop our revenues um, based on that. And that was a provincial decision. Um, so if, if, that, if that was to come to pass, if they were to, Decide that again, then this would be um, the drop that would occur. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, guys. Right. Go for it. Go oh, for okay. It. Um, through to Sarah, what I'm looking at is like, and I totally agree, like the 600,000 for photo radar and the 200,000 for the doctor's office. Right now, presently, over the last few years, we put a million dollars into our future building fund. So I'm not sure exactly where that money might have come out of the taxpayers. So if we're going to move in that direction, how about if we start saying the 600,000 and 200,000 indefinite, that money we will allocate to a savings. So if it disappears, it doesn't change tax. So if it disappears, we just put less money in the savings account. So those two could be directed as we're changing it around because right now we saved over the last few years, uh, $3 million into our 
future building fund another million. So if we take these two line, line items and use them strictly for building reserves only and not subsidizing tax. So we can move in that direction, maybe not this year, but next year, then if it disappears, that just means we have less money for our savings account and it doesn't affect our operational costs. Is that something we could work towards? Um, so the money that goes into, sorry, can't switch now. The money that goes into the, uh, are you talking about the, the future? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. That money is uh, moved into there directly from the money we, we receive from our revenue sharing agreement. Okay, so that yeah. is also right now an offset as well. We receive that in and mm -hmm. we go straight to reserve. So it wouldn't have any impact if we were to put it towards this, if you say. But the, uh, that is true. But the revenue sharing thing is like we have agreements in place. And I mean, and that's also out of our control exactly how much money we get. It's been great over the years. I'm not complaining, but that would be one. So what I'm thinking is where we're building money for that, take them directly out of these two unknown funds that could disappear tomorrow and use them for building a bank account. Okay, so you're proposing that we increase taxes by- No. Well, what, I, is, what I'm actually proposing- All right, we have a lot. Okay, but I'm, just so, I, I, so I'm clarifying on what I'm proposing is saying, we're saying the 600,000 we get from photo radar, which is up in the air is 5.3% but somehow we take other money. So the money in, you know, use this money only to build a savings account. In, it doesn't have to happen this year, but our future plan is the two unknown revenues, the 200 and the 600, whatever that money is goes into savings. Councillor yeah. Taylor. Sorry. Um, so you're saying that this entire, all five of these things, 1.7 1, 1. million, yes. all of it goes to operation, correct? Okay. Yes. Second question. The public health facilities rent revenue, that is the, that is the doctor's office. We have the, uh, we have two, uh, we have the doctor's office and we also have a, a residence that we share with the other county uh, for medical personnel to, oh. um, to rent within our community. Locals and new doctors. Okay. Thank you. All right. So any other questions? Move on. So now we move on to our review of uh, salaries, wages, and benefits for 2022. Uh, so for salaries, the uh, 2022 salary figures reflect increases set out in our management and out-of-scope compensation policy. What we mean by out-of-scope is we have a number of people um, that are non-union um, for such reasons as, uh, so for example, our, our um, human resources people, would not be in the union due to privacy issues. Um, we have some supervisory um, people as well. Uh, as, as far as our collective agreement goes, they have to be outside of the um, agreement. Um, also some staff that work um, some very odd hours um, to uh, provide their services for the community, such as our recreation programmers. Um, so they are also included in the, the non-union uh, part of this. Um, presentation. Uh, so based on the policy that was passed, the, the CPI average we use is an average of the previous year's uh, CPI from July, July to June, and we take the average of that. And the reason we do that is if we take a certain month, it, can, it doesn't really give a reflection of the entire year. Um, but July's was 3.7. <laughs> Earlier in the year, it was, it was under 1%. So we actually do do an average of that to um, to make it uh, to to apply to the salaries. So for this year, that is a one point five five. Under the wages, as I mentioned earlier, we have a collective agreement, and under that collective agreement, the increase for twenty twenty two for our unionised staff was two point five percent. And uh, just so that we can look at apples to apples when we're going through this, there was a wage position moved to a salary position between these two budgets. So um, we have uh, a, a column to show those percentage changes without that, so that we can look at apples to apples. Uh, so if we if we go to that column on the on the far right uh, to show the, the the differences between twenty one and twenty two, you'll see for the non union uh, is a two point nine percent, 
and that is the 1.55 plus of course people that have room to move up within their bands move up within their bands and again for the wages 2.83 for that same reason the 2.5 plus people moving up within their bands so overall for salaries and wages it is a 2.5 percent increase any questions Councillor Perception, uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm a bit challenged. Um, hearing questions on services, 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 cut, cut, cut services. Um, if you go to our financials, then you don't have to go very many years back. So can you suspend about $6 million on wages? We're at $9 million, that's $3 million. $100,000 is a 30% tax increase in wages. Um, uh, $9 million is, is a big chunk. And I, I guess the biggest question I have in this is when you say we have to cut services, uh, which services would be cut? And uh, then in the test of burden on that would be if they're cut, who would be affected and who would notice? So uh, maybe whenever he says we're out to cut services, because it's, it's, it's a question that's always thrown at councils that we'll cut services, we'll cut services. And it's a bit of a threat. So I'd like to know what services are cut. Um, we're high in wages for the community this size with our, with our equalized assessment. Um, our non-union wages almost match our unionized wages. Um, so I guess maybe I'm, I'm looking for efficiencies. Um, we, we, we're challenged with it. And this is the, I've gone through all the financials for the last seven years. And the biggest increase I've seen in everything uh, has been wages. So maybe, maybe explain to me which services, because we always say, well, same level of service. Well, which service? Would be the same level of service. So I need to know what what would change if we were to to decrease. Like where would we where would we cut if we were to cut? And maybe as a council we can analyze that and say are we willing to cut that? Because I I'm always challenged by it. So fair enough question, uh, Ms. Bittner. Uh, service level cuts I think would be um, purview of council for the levels of service. Um, I can explain the, the, the policy that was brought in through last year um, with, with a review of our current <coughs> levels of uh, compensation. Uh, we were below, um, some, some of our staff were below the uh, 50th percentile within the, the region, within the province of uh, similar sized towns. Um, and that was why we... Uh, we brought in a policy to start to slowly work towards um, having everybody at least at that 50th percentile. There were some that were higher, um, but there was um, a policy that was that was passed to have us start working towards that. So maybe Mr. Um, I don't think I'm challenged by bringing our staff to the 50th percentile. Uh, I don't think uh, I think to be competitive and to to maintain staff. I think my biggest challenge is is um, how we review our departments. I mean, we went through the matrix on orientation day and, you know, like we have a lot of layers and for me it is okay. Do we need four people in there? I mean, what are we getting for four people in a department? In one of the, but like that's to me is more of the challenge is, you know, like there's, there's departments in this town and I'm not going to pick on any single department, but I know there's departments. We used to have one employee and have the same level of service. And now we have four. And to me, that's, that's, I want to be a manager. So we need to hire some people to help me because I don't want to work in the evening or I don't want to do something. And to me, those are the challenges. I'm, looking for. I'm not talking about actual percentiles because it's, you know, if, if a CFO or a, a CAO gets paid a certain wage for a certain community of similar size or similar equalized assessment, because we can't use size because um, communities of the same size may have double our assessment, which means they have double the taxation power that we have. So for me, it's, it's how we looked at our internally, because if we overstaff our community, um, then what happens is we have no money left to put the tar on the road, right? You know, and that was told to us in orientation. I said, why didn't we finish tar? Well, we ran out of budget. So there's a challenge. We, we can't just have all these staff that they have nothing to work with. So I, I'm, I'm looking for efficiencies and not level of service cap, but where can we become more efficient? And, and to me, that's, that's the thing that's challenging. So, yeah. And it's not about the 50 percentile because people deserve <clears throat> to be compensated for their, their career path, but it's not, it's more of, do we have too many people? Uh, CEO Leverage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we went through an exercise in preparation for this workshop and um, to understand what the changes have been. 
Um, because looking at financial statements, um, you know, yes, there has been increases. Uh, what we did was also look at um, what's changed in the organization, what's changed in the structure. As you've noted, there, there have been changes over the years. We went back as far as uh, to 2016, because with our financial system, that was as far back as you know, was kind of within our reach very easily. And our changes have been, um, you know, it's actually interesting. Um, we've had some offsets uh, with with union, you know, as Sarah mentioned, changing from salary from union, etc., and some some adjustments. But in 2016, just for an example, and I'll just use numbers versus percentages at the start. So in 2016, there was 25 um, in total uh, as far as. Uh, so. I'm going to actually retract that. I'm going to give this as be an easier um, exercise. So I'm going to use the percentages because it helps you get show for the years. So from in 2017 it was 16% increases. 2018 was 3.4%. 2019 was a 10% increase. Uh, 2020 was zero and 2021 was zero. So what I want to just kind of go back to is that um, we're looking at, um, I would say this group is looking at our efficiencies and that's the kind of lens we are evaluating is when we're, when we're looking at the service levels and to be fair, the council sets the service levels and we'll be asking these councils to set the service levels so we know where to go and we can make adjustments about where we see fit. Um, one of the things is, is that as we, as we grow as an organization, as a community, Every time we take something on, there is someone, you know, in a, for an example, um, has to manage that. And I don't mean manage, it just operate or maintain. So adjustments have been made to the community over the last five years, six years, uh, for sure. As far as things that we've taken on, we'll use vision parking as an example. We've taken that on. That takes, um, you know, operations to um, manage that. So we, we are looking at the actual data when it comes to um, our, our salaries and, and our headcount. Um, you know, we, we are very much um, wanting to ensure that we do have the right level, uh, the amount of, of staff to manage. We're asking ourselves the hard questions. Do we need to do this? Do we need to continue to do this? And I would suggest that um, in the short time um, you know, that I've been here, as well as now, um, James, this is a focus area for us. Also point out too that uh, I do recall that we had to add two staff to the wastewater treatment plant. As a part of our operational requirements there. I think that was in 20, I don't know, 2019. Yeah, so um, there's been some pressures there as well. But anybody else have any questions? Uh, Councilor Meyer. Thanks. Um, Councilor Procession, that's something that I've been thinking a lot about too. And um, I, I don't know where all the, the numbers come from, but I know with the increase in using of computers, um, I know the first year that I was on council, you know, we had to kind of um, at you know, at a position to to manage that because you know without managing that we can get into huge problems and um, I, I don't know what all the you know the individual uh, staff members that have been increased but I but I have recognized that um, you know without having an HR manager things turn quickly into chaos in an organization right you know all these things have to be managed uh, or or dealt with I suppose in, in some fashion um, and doing it on the side of the desk hasn't been optimal. Um, and we've seen that um, reviewing it, I think is fantastic. I, I think it's a great question and um, you know, I'm interested to hear more about it. Um, but I have recognized that there are some positions that um, you know, regulations have changed. Um, you know, government, uh, from what I've heard, uh, you know, things have changed with that as well. So you know, that they're asking us to reduce red tape, but in fact, they're adding so much more on that we have to have more people to manage the red tape that they've asked us to reduce. So it's like it's just it, it it's kind of crazy um, to think of it that way. But that that's how I've been understanding it, and and it, it's certainly frustrating um, because you know we haven't been able to increase our tax base, but but we. But with changes in you know the government and society, we we still have to manage these things. And and having someone do it on the side of the desk, we've you know I I've learned anyway. So I shouldn't say we. I've learned that that is not attainable um, for years and years. Someone can do that for a little bit, but it it doesn't work out long term. And, and I've seen the you know some neglect of that, um, which you know it, it's a challenge. Uh, um, okay. Um, 
yes, we need to review the wages, but to answer Councillor Persichny's question, some examples what we've worked with, and last, the last two years have been weird because COVID, our numbers are all screwed because people work from home now. But some things we looked at, as example, we were cutting grass, which is a savings in areas that didn't need to be mowed as often. We cut out uh, dust control, which saved us money but caused us other grief. So examples like that that we've used, we may have to look at and I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but even some of the places, maybe some of our snow removal where we're giving Cadillac service, we may uh, have to tell the public that due to savings, which will not affect you long term. So if you don't cut grass, you don't do snow, it's not as if you're letting roads and sidewalks go, but certain examples like that we may have to look at. And I believe uh, when we go to our re retreat or something that will give administration time so we can look at each department. I know exactly what Council Petition is talking about. Yes, we had to increase staff like the water sewer treatment plant, certain areas, but other areas we have to look at because I would agree too, we need to look at how much money our assessment is versus the amount of staff. And we always hear rumors and right or wrong, we're too top heavy. And maybe we need to re review that. And then what I like about the review, we can silence them to say, maybe we are not too top heavy. We just need to prove that all these people are of value. Uh, uh, CEO Beveridge, uh, I'm sure you want to respond. Um, I also want to comment, I think this is why we need to do a prior, priority based budget model, um, because I think that would flush out, you know, where the priorities are and where the resources need to go. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I was going to mention that, so thank you. Um, I did, I apologize for my, my blunder earlier, as far as the counts, um, I just wanted to just give a picture because headcounts, I understand, mm -hmm. um, you know, like during our, our uh, orientation, we talked about them a little bit. We do have the numbers in 2016. So when we're talking about salaries is, is out of, right? The, the wages are all uh, the collective agreement. So salary um, is 25 for 2016. 2017 was 29. 2018 was 30. 2019 was 33. 2020, 33 and 2021. 21, 33 as well. So uh, adjustments, if you will, like so as far as headcounts and adding to maybe adjustments per se, and that's something that we are looking at. But I do, um, you know, that definitely has been on our minds as far as um, really aligning our budget towards uh, working towards that priority-based budgeting is something we'll be talking about in the near future. All right. Um, so I think this would be a perfect time for a break. Um, and then we'll move on to our next section. The next section.
All right, we will uh, resume the budget workshop. And uh, if you do have questions, just ask that there's no need to go through the chair. Um, and uh, let's uh, continue on. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Going on to our departmental level, there's quite a number of them, but it's some uh, uh, are fairly, uh, will, be, will be fairly quick. As I said earlier, before we start, I'll go through each of the columns, so that they, uh, that they um, idea of what we're looking at here and how, how we're presenting this. So obviously we start with last year's budget and the next column are what we call the corrections and trends. So this would be where if we happen to have any projects that were one-off projects last year, we remove them here. This is also where the managers go through and look at the trends and if there needs to be adjustments to their budgets, it goes into this column as well. The obligations we spoke about earlier, these were all of the, the obligations that we showed you are listed within this column here. So these are the ones where we have the external influences um, and there's one or two items that are policy driven as well. That comes to our 2022 base. So this is where, as we've said many times, this would be the cost to continue the same level of service as 2021. Uh, past that, there are service changes that uh, have been um, put in from the different departments. So these would be increases in level of service. That would be an additional um, budgetary impact, additional taxation impact. These would be ongoing into the future, not necessarily one-off projects. The additional budget requests, they are... Uh, uh, other items that um, the, the different departments have requested, and I'll go through those as we go through, because there's a number of different variations within um, the additional budget requests. And then that comes to what we call the 2022 budget column. This one then includes all of everything to the base, as well as the additional items that we've just spoken about. So moving on from there, the first one we have up is what we call our fiscal page. This is where we look at our, our taxation our requisition payments um, and some um, fiscal items like comp, uh, franchises and um, items like that. So uh, within the taxes, these have just been entered to show um, the different levels of, of the, how the taxes will go up to um, incorporate A to the base budget and B to the, uh, the other budget. Here. Mm -hmm. Uh, revenue sharing, we've um, dropped our expectation down of by about 500,000 just based on trends, based on the last few years. Uh, it's been um, a little lower than 4.5. So, under the concession and franchises, you'll see under over on the um, obligations column. This is the we spoke about this at council a few weeks ago, and uh, council set the rates at the same percentage of rates. So this is actually the, the increase in revenue from that rate that was set at that council meeting. So it's been an increase of 137,000 from our franchises. Uh, we've also added 50,000 to our other revenues, um, just based on our investments for the last probably 10 years. <laughs> uh, interest rates haven't been great and our money has been just in our general account, getting more interest than it could have reinvested, but uh, that's starting to change. And we're investing a bit more money, so we're hoping to get some more revenue here. <laughs> uh, so moving down, I'm not going to go through every line on every page either. This is just the, uh, the, the fiscal one here. Um, as you can see, we have our transfers from reserves, and that's the, uh, the, the drop in the reliance on those subsidisations that we talked, spoke about earlier. Um, and then our transfers to reserves of the uh, 4 million we are predicting to get, I'm looking under sorry, the base column here of the 4 million we're predicting to get from the Yellowhead County Revenue Sharing, 3 million to the Revenue Sharing Reserve, 1 million to the uh, Future sort of Culture Centre Reserve, as we have done historically. Uh, the Energy Reserve uh, has a, uh, we're replenishing a little bit back from those subsidisations that we looked at as well. 
as well as there's 13,000 going into the energy reserve. This was based on the amount within our policy that we had, the 1.55 we mentioned at the council meeting. The line below that, I've called it franchise fee reserve. This is not at all where it, could, it can stay, it can go um, elsewhere. It's just for a placeholder here. The 123,000 is the extra revenue generated by keeping those rates the same as was passed at the council meeting a couple of weeks ago. So this is money that is coming in um, additionally to what was uh, listed in our policy. So I've set that in a separate line. You'll also see it as a separate reserve in our reserve sheets. Um, so this is this is the extra money that was generated from the franchise fees um, for councils uh, to uh, to um, discuss the with the home for that, I suppose. There were many uh, a few things mentioned around the table for the use of that. So I've just put it into one place for now. Just on that, Sarah, I don't know, just this is just my opinion, but I think both of those franchise fees should go into the energy reserve. Um, we have a lot of under underground burial that we need to do. We have a lot of other infrastructure we need to do, and I don't know, it just makes sense to put both of those in the same reserve. That's just my thought. Um, can I, I uh, oh, go ahead? Yeah, I, uh, I like that idea as well. Um, we look in the Mary Bergeron. Uh, by uh, Park on Lodge. Uh, lots of work needs to be done there that uh, hasn't been done. Uh, and that money would be great to uh, to be used there. Okay, uh, uh, Sarah, on where we are putting the 3 million into the uh, multiplex and a million into the future civic slash culture center, that would, if we put the million in, there would be 4 million in that fund. And if I'm understanding right, we could transfer the four million out and put it into the multiplex if uh, there's a cost overrun. Would that be correct? Because like we're like it's four million going into building fund. I fully understand that, but now we're splitting and we're going three and one. So now the second one would have four million dollars. If I understood the figures in the back after we put the million in this year, that four million could be moved to the multiplex. Correct. Yeah, in, yeah, any reserve can be adjusted through council and, and used to fund uh, the projects they wish. We have some reserves that are set and they must be used for the purpose they are um, made for. Uh, a lot of them can be um, allocated out separately. We do like to keep them in line with where they are. The revenue sharing is one where that money just goes directly there. Um, and uh, it is up to council how they, they use some of those reserves. So to make my, just for my question simple, they're both for the same purpose. So they'd be very easy to add to one project. No, uh, Councilor Schnarr, the revenue sharing is not going to- No, no, us. no, no. But what I'm so, looking at, revenue sharing says that we put 3 million into the multiplex. You know, it's not going in the multiplex anymore. The multiplex is a separate reserve. We already have that funded. Right, but then where's the three million going? It goes into that reserve and then council allocates it at the end of the year. Okay, so the other four million putting over there can be transferred because I fully appreciate when you put money into savings allocated for a project for something, you can't just take it out. But both of these savings accounts are indirectly connected together, could be used for either or. Uh, based on the funding for the multiplex, that is, we have a reserve set up for the multiplex that has the required funding in there Correct. as of now. But if we're going to have to borrow nine million, we could borrow five and take four and put it over there and borrow less. Is the question I'm looking at? If council so desires, yes. Okay, my question is answered. Thank you. And also the uh, decrease in revenue sharing amount based on downwards trend. What is the what is the calculation towards that downwards trend? There is a formula that uh, the, the county used to determine their uh, share to us. Uh, it's based on their non-residential assessment. Um, they, they add a, a, a certain portion to that and that is then shared amongst um, Hinton also is, 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 has their own agreement with the county as well. Um, based on the population around us at the time, 
So there are some uh, many of uh, a couple of factors that come into that. Is this does this connected to companies not mm -hmm. not paying taxes and, and uh, okay not paying this okay thank you. You can't, but you have to wait till you get it. You can't budget with that. Yeah. Okay. That mistake was made years ago. And then when it changed, it could have changed, it could have affected the finances drastically. That's okay. one of the reasons why, as for the other side of the table, it may not occur. Um, we put all most of this funding into reserve because um, if something changes, we don't want it impacting our operational budget. So when do we know in the year like how much? We officially get the check. We get the check. Fair enough. All right. Yeah. And then it's in the bank. Yeah. Done. Check. Yeah. Then um, you know you have it. All right. So, yeah. I'll put the cart before the horse. Not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and that, that is true. That's why we put it directly to reserve, and uh, we do try. Uh, we do try not to use it within the year that it's due to us, because we do not get it till very near the end of the year. Um, so if we do start using that budget wise, I start. <laughs> just, I'd like to have it first, please. Before no, we... <laughs> no. All right. And anything that you see in our budgets that are using revenue sharing policing, two hundred twenty thousand dollars, correct, uh, Ms. Bittner? That's from previous years' funding. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions on the the uh, the fiscal? To move on to the legislative and executive office. Legislative is the, the council um, expenses. So you see here with uh, we have honoraria now a little bit based on uh, your council remuneration policy and also the inclusion of the council dependent allowance. Uh, there was some remo removal of costs for the election. Um, uh, and we're uh, under the reserves. We're actually asking, putting another five thousand dollars towards the election reserve. So we have ten thousand per year. So we can offset those expenses via reserve rather than taxation within that given year having a little jump. Any questions on legislative? I think uh, Ms. Bittner, um, what uh, was the cost of running the election this year? It, it was uh, between twenty five and twenty six thousand. Was that including the Senate and yes? So we'll get reimbursed for we get we receive about uh, just over sixteen thousand as a like two dollars per capita, so high sixteen thousand. So it's a net of about nine thousand dollars per capita votes or per capita for the unity per capita community. Wow, that's not bad. That's at least it wasn't by votes. <laughs> 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 Um, the other question is the 15,000 for a cool counting machine. Was that factored in or is that over and above? That's part of it. So that 26,000 was part of, I believe it was 15,000 for the counting machine. Uh, I'd have to check my records on that. But it was just roughly it's, 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 it's a large portion of the. Thank you. The and those are just rented or yeah. just contracted up? We didn't own that for 15 grand. I thought we bought it. <laughs> no, sir. Well, I better pay attention. I thought we were buying this machine. Oscillate. Wow, yes. then you have to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then how much does counters cost? Like physical bodies. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me that again. Ms. Mayor, I, I'm just speaking to the ad additional budget request on this item. Uh, you'll notice the 50,000. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to make sure the council is aware we do have the fifty thousand dollars as far as for council tech uh, for tech for this for this room uh, to be able to um, provide uh, microphones for each of the council members. Um, also, uh, and I'm fine, obviously, uh, as well as uh, cameras that do shift to each individual speaker when they're speaking, um, and as well, if I'm missing anything else. Those are the main ones. So yeah, we've been working with uh, three different companies to get some quotes together and we should have that shortly. So the idea is also to be able to um, be able to transport. It's one of those things where sometimes we have the opportunity and need the opportunity to be able to move to another facility in order to host, uh, for example, public hearings, etc. It's happened in the past. And so being able to actually pick up, 
and go is something that I wanted to have included in this quote. It's something we might have to remove out, but it's something I'd like to understand where we're at. So um, it's, uh, we are in the process. So right now the, the quotes are coming in, but uh, in that range of about 50,000 dollars So you're telling me I'll finally have my own mic? I've never had one. No, everybody so went, everybody gets one but you. I'm looking forward to it. As you see, I'm always in Does it include a mute button? I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Perfect. I just, um, sorry, on the, uh, the election. Uh, so you said it cost about 25, 26,000. So why are we going to put $10,000 a year? Because that'll be $40,000 by the end. Uh, with elections come other expenses too. Um, we need to legislatively put on the orientation sessions. They have some expenses. There may be some expenses for um, additional um, resources that are needed for a new council as well. So we're trying to also mitigate those by not having them come in in, in, in that cyclical way as well and they're always being able to be funded from the reserve. If we don't use it all, that will stay in, in that reserve. Okay. Uh, and just some further feedback uh, that, that I've heard is uh, people really like the advance vote date, but they wish there was more than one. So hopefully we can plan for that for, for the next election. Because I think that was well taken advantage of this year as well. Okay, yes, I had, thank you, Sarah Beveridge. I had uh, omitted to uh, <laughs> address that line. So if I do, uh, if I am asking to move on and there's something else, just point at the screen for an hour, I'll know it. I'll move on. Uh, so now I will ask any other questions from the legislative. <laughs> Moving on to the executive office. Uh, there was one of the one of the items here to uh, I'd like to to uh, address is you'll see a decrease in professional development expenses. You'll see that coming through across the board. Um, to help with this uh, budget, we did go back to our, our departments and ask if they could review their development, their professional development uh, budgets, and we did remove around $26,000 uh, from the budget um, based on that. So you'll see one of these, like this is a recurring thing through the many departments, uh, so I won't be, won't be touching on it um, all the time. Is that, I'm sorry, is that based on <clears throat> not traveling places and, and, and just doing professional development more virtual, or is it just... This no. was actually the, uh, these are the actual course expenses. So um, we've gone through and just looked at uh, the trends, the requirements, those types of things. And uh, each department came back with some savings that they found within that for us. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, the, the personnel column on these, I won't go into them in much detail because we looked at it as a whole, but if there is anything specific to bring to attention, I will, uh, with an executive office. That's the town manager office. Sorry, yes, that's the town manager office, yes. Uh, there was uh, a little bit of realigning here. It didn't make, uh, there's a, I don't know, there's even a thousand there, but we did, um, we did have a position. We had a retirement um, very, uh, around the 2019 sort of COVID area there, and that remained within the budget. So we did have um, some ability there, and we are proposing uh, at, at this budget to reallocate that position to the economic development budget, and we can talk more about that when we get to that department. Um, also, with some re redistribution of uh, our staff and some of those uh, areas that go back, we do have uh, a few areas that are a one-person department. <laughs> so, if it came to pass that uh, that personal line actually gave way uh, uh, for privacy issues, um, because it's only a one-person department, we have uh, moved. Um, those salaries into uh, the executive department here. So that's the, uh, the difference there with the personnel. As I say, I'll only address that if there's something different within the personnel. So in the, in the, so this reflects how many personnel, including the one that doesn't really belong in there? Uh, this, re this reflects, I don't have the, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, council position. I don't have the, 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 the counts for each department. Okay, that's okay. Um, and then, or in some of these budgets, are we allocating like other departments' expenses towards it in the personnel? Like so, like like accounting has to create them a payroll, so they assign some of their budget towards them. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, uh, you'll see there are some so other. True reflection of wages in that department. That's 
like things. multiple different things to get an allocated. That is correct. Yes, we try and look at um, at our areas and get uh, a, a really good uh, uh, understanding of what an area costs us. So there are uh, many positions that are, are, are scattered through many different departments um, to get to that. Can we uh, get that information sent out to us afterwards in terms of how many personnel in this department? Yes, we will be able to get that for you for sure. Thank you. Uh, and then the other thing I think of note for executive office is we have decided to centralize our legal fees. Uh, the legal fees were within the department that that may have related to. Uh, we've now decided to centralize that within the executive office. It can then be uh, uh, monitored better and just easier coming out of one area for our legal fees. One other question for something. I mean, I'm assuming that the, the, the numbers also will include all benefits. And... Yeah. Yes, yes, they do. Well, Ms. Binner, um, what uh, has been the trend with our legal fees and what line item does that fall under? So legal fees would come under the contracted and general services. Okay. Uh, our, our legal fees historically been budgeted around the sort of company wide around the 20,000 mark. Do we, um, do we have a, a reserve for? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. You said 20,000, but it says here 108,000? No, that's for all. Contracts. Oh, it's for all, for all things. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Well, all yes. <clears throat> it's all contracted and general services, isn't it? So My it's not problem. just legal. Sorry, yes. keep going. My apologies. Do we have uh, any kind of reserve for legal fees at all? Uh, not at this time, no. I know similar sized communities are spending over $100,000. So. Well, you throw one grievance in there, it's 100 grand. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Sue Beverly. Mr. Mayor, uh, legal fees uh, do, as, as you mentioned, council position, uh, you know, essentially it's kind of like insurance. Essentially, if you have, you know, years, it's very, it's challenging for sure. Um, this, uh, in my experience, is an exceptionally low legal budget. Uh, but, um, you know, based on the information and actuals, you know, this is where we're at. So we're, that's um, really the purpose of uh, centralizing is to get a better handle and understanding of where we're spending money on legal. And uh, there are there are ways to mitigate that as well. So we have uh, services within AUMA that uh, offers casual legal. We have services with, um, it's called E2R, that actually offers us, it's all a part of our AUMA package um, that allows us, um, you know, no, you know, in excess, uh, or lack of excessive fees on HR matters as well. So we utilize services that, so we just wanted to get a better handle is which was the, really the purpose of uh, centralizing these fees. Any further questions on? I promise not to see anybody. And we know there's a discontinuation of the parties. There's a discontinuation of the parties. You said car lease? Yeah. Are you not getting, are you getting an allowance then? No. We have a corporate pool for vehicles. All right. Coming on to um, human resources. Uh, there was uh, some of the, the, the changes here. Um, one was the discontinuation of the Municipal Affairs Internship Program. Uh, so we're not going up um, next year to uh, receive another intern. Uh, some of the, so those uh, would rather we are reallocating those um, expenses more towards um, our existing staff. Okay. Uh, there also was a um, last year they had a, a, a program to change us to the new payroll system, PGI. Uh, so that is being uh, removed from the contracted services. But further down, you can see it was funded from a reserve. Uh, so we're also removing that funding. That's really the um, most of my chart. Any questions? We like PGI. <laughs> Do you use it? Uh, yes, no, we do use it. Yes. How do you like it? Yeah, we're, uh, we're getting there. It's always, there's always a, a uh, um, going to a new system, right? There was the, the, the bumps along the way, but no, we're, we're absolutely getting there. It's going to be um, good for 
I think uh, our HR department has spent a lot of time with data entry rather than concentrating on human resources uh, uh, items. Uh, sir, um, did I hear you right? So there's the grant is gone for the intern then, is that correct? Uh, the grant itself is not gone, no. Um, we are determined this year to not apply for a, a, another year for okay. uh, another intern. Thank you. Continue on. I like the response you did over there, that's all. <laughs> I'll check the cameras later. <laughs> She's not on the camera. I'm just so excited. So <laughs> we need the individual cameras. She didn't say anything. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay, so we can move on from here to uh, communications. Now, this is where you see um, the removal of uh, the, the, for the privacy issue, the, the uh, uh, Reallocation of the um, personnel over to the executive office. Apart from that, really no change for the um, operations for communication department. So, any questions on that? Why Steve's making a lot of money? <laughs> I was going to comment the same. Um, I guess I do have the contracted services. That's where someone was contracted and we switched them over to wages. Is that correct? Or what's the contracted services and communication? Uh, no, those uh, contracted services for, um, for example, things like running our, our website. Um, I may defer to Mr. Bethji, if I may. Yeah, the main, <laughs> the main portion would be um, for uh, the running of our website. We, have, we hire out certain hours for them to work on that and, and our mobile app and the reporter problem, that sort of thing. Oh, okay, so that's the contracted to bring all that new stuff. Okay, thank you. I know we also spoke at orientation that it's hard when the communications director is on holiday and all of a sudden we're sort of trying to farm out to uh, other departments to, to cover this work. Uh, and I don't see anything, I know we had talked about orientation, I don't see anything to cover that sort of cost or if that's something that council wants to look at. And I know you've just spoken about, you know, salaries and adding salaries, but, um, you know, is there opportunities for assistance within this, like department because it's so important right and now more than ever to get the right message out about what we're doing and um, it's a lot of work in terms of one person um, I don't know what council's thoughts are on it or administration but uh, you know it's, it's a lot of work for one person to get that one message out that we need that it's ever so important um. <clears throat> We have had many discussions about some of these areas, as I noted uh, within the council orientation, about some of these areas that are critically important. And um, what we've done is we've asked um, uh, Mr. Bethany to, to review uh, as far as, like, is there an opportunity to have another staff member be that back? Because I, you know, I, I appreciate your comments, Council Taylor, because um, communication doesn't sleep. There are times that we, you know, I, I believe that, that um, you know, individuals are entitled to a work-life balance. And so it is something that we are evaluating. Um, in that, we need to evaluate it uh, to make sure that we can't, you know, maybe we can handle it internally versus moving towards putting something towards us at this time. So we, we are we're looking into that. Okay, thank you. Um, Move on to corporate services. Uh, we have our administration. The, this is the uh, area where, where uh, administration has great support for the rest of the organization as well. So a lot of the, of the, of the costs flow through here. Uh, under the revenues, the main um, change there was the loss of the naming rights agreement that we had with Repsol Place. They were giving us 100,000 per year that was going to a reserve. Uh, and that finishes, um, 2021 was the last year for that. So you'll see that that has gone down there, but also down under the transfers to reserves, you'll see the corresponding transfer to reserves being removed. So that really has no impact on, on the taxation. It's just worthy to note. 
Let me see um, there. Um, excuse me. Where, where was that reserve going into? Which? Like, we, had it it going, it, we had it going into the capital reserve for the multi, the multi-use facility. Okay. Thank you. Have we had any interest in someone else taking the name, the naming rights, and how much money? Is it again? Just to refresh my memory, how much money were we getting per year on the rights? It's right there. It's right there. It's right there. It was hundred. No, I thought it was hundred thousand total. It wasn't hundred thousand dollars a year. It was hundred thousand a year. It was hundred thousand dollars over yeah. ten yeah. years. Or yeah. Okay, so that's right. Yeah, I thought it was hundred thousand dollars per year, and we're not uh, pursuing that right now because of the multiplex. There'll be a whole naming right. Yes. Well, no, that's where I was confused. It was hundred thousand, but it was a million dollars, hundred thousand a year paid over ten years. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's some um, there's some uh, increases for auditor assessment contracts um, items like that. The other main, I think, major amount you can see here is under the other expenses. Last year we had we did a utility rebate um, off on the utility bills, so that uh, was funded from here. That was the removal of that. Sorry, it wasn't funded from here. It was expensed here, but again, you can see under the uh, transfer from reserves that was actually funded from the COVID reserve. So that's also a removal from both areas, so it doesn't have an impact on taxation. Uh, that's the main uh, areas there. Uh, only other thing under the additional budget request is just a request for an additional thousand to be transferred to a, the administrating operating reserve so that we would have 3,000 going in per year. Um, in here it says new lease amount on well site until 2025. What's that about? Uh, Within um, the town, or uh, we, we do charge for the leases for wells that are within our town that aren't the town wells. It's like they're called well sites. Um, is that Mr. Fisher? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that, one, that one, I believe, is, is uh, a lease for a new metering facility for one of the oil and gas companies that operates in town on one of our properties. Okay. I'll change that to metering site instead of well site. <laughs> so that's just the lease we have until 2025. So there's a slight increase there for those years. Is that on the uh, like on the kinder board or is that like on the last year? I'll have to go and look at that one. The other piece of admin, I'll move on. Into the information technology. Um, within the up to the base budget, there is some increase in licensing fees. They happen every year. Um, it's under the obligations. Uh, and really, uh, now we talk about uh, past the base budget here. There's some amounts added. We have. Um, Two amounts under the 78,000 you see there. One is a, a smaller one for increasing uh, bandwidth within the civic centre, a, a little bit of more security within our server. But there's also a request in there for 75,000 for a company that will do a 24 hour IT support. They um, do our cyber security 24 7. They also run the help desk, so they do triage for the help desk. Uh, so if it's something that they can handle, they do that. If it's not, they will then pass it down to our IT person. This is another one of those one-person departments. Uh, so that would help with um, alleviating some of um, those issues that fall directly on this one person. Um, we are um, suggesting this for uh, this additional request uh, to go to this company based on the fact that you then get all the expertise of the people within that company um, so that we, we can draw on that through this one contract. Whereas, you know, sometimes if you hire a, a single person, they only bring the expertise that that, that, that person is aware of. And this, uh, based on these costs, this would be less than hiring a full-time person. But we would have 24-hour coverage of our systems. Um, we talked about communication now, IT, is there any way, like, because we always said the running shorthanded and listening to what you're saying, we look at the contract, 
Would it be valuable to us to get a person that maybe has skills in both IT as well as communication? I know they're different, but they're similar tasks. Uh, Councillor Chenard, they are very different. I know it's um, within here, we do have our IT person backing up our, our um, comms person in, in times, but they have very different skill sets. No, um, so to get the, um, I think the level of expertise we would require under both of those departments, um, it would be very difficult to find one person that has both those levels. That, um, well, the only reason I'm mentioning that is because we do have an individual like that and I and I fully understand the both, but a lot of times when you're hiring a person, they have skills in both. So they are full-time IT, they can back up as communication. And I know Steve, an example, a lot of times, he can help out the other way. They are very different, but it's similar technology they're using. It's just the thought. Mm -hmm. oh, sir. Uh, Ms. Bittner, where is this IT company located? As uh, uh, Councillor Moore, um, at the moment we haven't uh, decided on a particular company. Uh, this was a, uh, a quote we got just um, talking to some other municipalities that have, have companies. This would, would go out for a um, RMP process, a request for proposal process, um, to ensure that we get the company that meets our, our needs. Uh, so we don't actually have a particular company in mind at this time. Is that uh, Canadian or American or either? Would it be? This, these would be one of the things that would be within our request for proposal um, to, uh, to, to narrow that down if, if so desired. Uh, would the 75,000, that wouldn't pay for an on, so if our IT person was on holidays, would that pay for someone to be on site then, or are we still contracted to a help desk for this company? Is that, I don't know what the vision is for this? I, I believe that is uh, that there would be someone who would be able to come for the emergencies, things like that. That also one of those things we will put in the RFP. A request for proposal is where we list down all the requirements we wish or desire in a particular project, um, and then people bid on those based on, on that. So that would be something that would come in, I think, under that RFP process. Because that's the biggest concern that I have is someone is on, someone's on site. That's what we're going to need for the time period where a key person is taking much deserved days off, so, okay. Councilor Taylor asked my question. Oh, okay. Who's doing that? Oh, four. <laughs> <laughs> you should see, I have no name, it's just only four. Teamwork. <laughs> yeah. Now we're moving into infrastructure and, um, Planning department, and we have our, our new GM with us, as well as the interim GM to answer any of our questions because I'm probably not going to be able to answer all of them <laughs> with the list. I think Clayton, you're now on the hot seat. <laughs> He's been here a week, he knows it all. <laughs> um, <laughs> six days, six days. Six, oh, this was a yeah. six day yeah. then, yeah. Done. He's working on a set. <laughs> <laughs> That's the six days, exactly. Uh, the first area we have with the infrastructure planning is the animal power that is run out of the public works building. So it falls under, under the purview here. This is an area that is cost shared with Yellowhead County at a 50% cost share. Uh, as you can see, um, really no change from 2021. So any questions? Is that still contracted out some of the care? Because at one time we're using through ears or when they are they still running this and we pay them a fee? Is that correct? I believe that did not continue. It did not continue. So we actually have a staff, uh, a town staff running the town now. So my question is availability on Saturdays and Sundays. There's no availability. Maybe someone's going to surrender an animal. A lot of it's done on call if, if it works. Um, so they would call the general line or we'll schedule something for, for Monday morning if needed. But a lot of it's done on call after hours. The There's reason actually that, no personnel dedicated to here, so it actually comes out of our public works budget. The reason I'm asking is sometimes people will pick up a straight cat or a dog and going, oh my God, why am I bothered with that? I picked it up Friday night and now I got to look after it till Monday morning. So there is a line they can call because the excuse was brought me up, it's run by ears and I'm going, I don't think so anymore. 
because a lot of times strays will show up and people want to get the problem solved. Uh, just uh, for the guys in the back, you can just speak up a bit so we'll start to hear you. Yeah, sorry, but uh, uh, you would call the on call public works number and, and see if somebody can come in on an on, on call, on call basis. Uh, personnel budget is sitting in our public works budget and all to the animal account. Okay, thanks. Right, uh, one thing I will bring up here because I haven't addressed it earlier. You'll notice a line in here called gross recovery. So I'll explain what gross recovery is within this municipality. Uh, and that, and that, that does actually address the personnel issue that um, was bringing up. So gross recovery, you'll see it under some of our revenues and you'll see it under some, uh, some of our expenses. These are those items that are a revenue to one department and an expense to another. So they're internally decided between um, the different departments. So they have no, no effect on our taxation overall because they cancel each other out. Um, but we do have to, um, for our financials, um, track them separately so that we know what they are. So here with this, this 41,000 gross recovery expense is actually the transfer of um, uh, estimated labour costs for the pound from the public works budget. So when we get to public works, from Greenings page, we're going to see some gross recovery revenue. More than the 41, but I'll also explain that when we get there. But that's included in that revenue of there and an expense here. So that's a, 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 a explanation of what those gross recoveries are. If no questions on pounds, I will move on. Question now, Sarah. On our animal pond here, are we still adopting the dogs out in that and cats? That is a revenue that would come to us that we adopt to the people here, which would uh, offset our supplies for food and, and everything else in there. Uh, I'm not 100%, as far as I'm aware, um, Councillor Devon, it's been included in the, the sales of goods and services line okay. we have here. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm certain we still do the adoption. Yeah, I know at one time there, you could go to Walmart and anything that was broken open, they would give to the town that broken open dog food, cat food, or whatever, and that and it would save us a lot of money, then people would come and adopt. And it was actually a kind of a large uh, fee that came into us if we were adopting animals over there. I hear that Council Sherrod wants to do cat licensing in town, which would be a huge... Definitely, because I have, I'm all dogs. <laughs> I'm joking. And seconded by Council for I do. I did to do a cat by love. How did you know I put a cap on that? This year. <laughs> <laughs> I did do cat licensing in one of my other communities and it actually went really terribly. So. <laughs> yes, it always does. <laughs> um, just to let you know. <laughs> that was a good idea. The thing is, if you lose your cat and it has a license tag on it, then at least you get your cat back. So, um, is there anything that we can do differently to um, prevent certain areas of town, even while it's campaigning? I heard complaints about cats. Um, is there anything we can do differently to um, either enforce, whether through enforcement or education, um, to kind of you know, some areas like you know, walking, you can see like six cats walking everywhere, and it's like, oh wow, okay, that's a bit much. Um, and, and, you know, for the people that live there that can't have flower beds, it's quite frustrating, um, especially if they don't even have a cat. Um, is there anything we can do differently that isn't a, um, you know, like a cat tagging system um, or even educational to the public that, you know, they, their cats either get returned or, or encourage them to just even have their own tag, right? I mean, sometimes people have, you know, their own tag, like, hey, if lots return to so-and-so. Um, is there anything we can do differently than that, than that we are to help mitigate that issue? I think that's more of a strategic planning question, yeah. a budgetary question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but I think a revenue stream. Yeah, I know she's talking about revenue tags. stream, but that's a much, much bigger conversation. So yeah, um, I think we'll, we'll hold that. But I think it's a good thing that we need to discuss. For sure. uh, uh, remind me, I have a solution for that. I used to raise those kind of caps. Was that a council position? 
Uh, I'll save it for the strategic planning. Oh, you're going to move that motion forward? We're going to have a whole day to discuss that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just want to keep us moving here because we still have tons to get through, and capital is going to take some time as well. So. <laughs> Move on to, to public works. Um, let's draw attention to the, the gross recovery revenue as we were just speaking about. Uh, that does include the 41,000 you saw, but also public works and fleet has all the costs for our vehicles going through there. So all the maintenance, all the fuel, um, all those costs go to one area, and then we charge the other areas for the use of those vehicles. So there's expenses within the other areas, and that comes back to revenue here. So because as you see those. Just know that they do offset each other throughout the uh, budget. So, um, since we went to leasing, and I don't remember how long we went that last year, or so have we have any results that there is savings? Because when we changed to leasing more vehicles rather than purchasing, we were sold in the idea it was going to save us money. Do we have any stats to back that up that it's better to lease than own? I'll jump in on that one. Okay. Um, so. Uh, only a very small percentage of our fleet and uh, the vehicles and equipment that we have to maintain are actually currently leased. We have about 67 or 68 pieces of equipment that, that exist throughout the organization. So that's not just vehicles, that's also pieces of equipment, um, skid steers, attachments, trailers, stuff like that. So only eight of those pieces are leased um so uh i i believe that it would reduce the amount we were spending on those larger pieces of equipment that are actually being leased but as in terms of the whole unit it's not fixing all of our, our maintenance like it's just a small percentage so with the small percentage that would give us stats because i agree when it's sold to us they're going to say okay a uh, greater because I argue on the other half, if we lease a greater, we have a fixed cost per year. So I'm just trying to compare, like you said, there's only eight out of 68 that we lease the rest we own. So I'm just looking at what makes more sense to lease you know, more or lease less, which is better because where someone, let's say these vehicles that would be a supervisor vehicle and we keep it for 10 years and as it gets mild and wore down in the history, we just pass them on to different <clears throat> departments for less use. So I'm just trying to understand if we could have savings, you know, if we lease 75% or leasing is not a savings option. Now that time has gone by, I'm just trying to figure out if we have any information on that. I just, I don't know if we've got enough money in our lease budget to lease the whole fleet. I don't know that we've got enough money sitting in our lease budget um, currently to lease the entire fleet of vehicles. Okay, I'm just looking for stats and numbers and percentage. Thank you. With the uh, uh, supply chain problems as they are now, I'm wondering uh, what the lease picture looks like for the next few months, weeks. Your name goes on the list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind, of, kind of kind of actually does look like that so we've had with our our camera this year um there's been a lot of discussion particularly around the type of vehicle that we were looking at to get with the, the camera system for the sewer inspections um difficulties in chaining uh electronics for the vehicles and it's it's pushed a lot of deliveries for some of the equipment that would for the vehicles that we would see typically for that um Quite a far away time. So, on a lot of those quotes that received and proposals we received, it was to be determined for six or eight months out. So, for um, Public Works, has been some um, alignment of budget for equipment maintenance for the actual costs and needs. The ones that we do still maintain are getting older. Um, and then uh, there was a, um, a shift, oh, that's again, under the materials, goods and supplies for the parts and supplies that we buy as well uh, to align with more actual costs over the trends for the last couple of years. Any 
Some shuffling in, in the corrections and trends column here. Um, we did some bank work in Centennial Park last year, uh, so that expense has been removed. I've built down to reserves that was funded from infrastructure reserve that has also uh, been removed for the 2022 phase. Uh, uh, the uh, transportation manager has uh, moved, uh, just transferred 60,000 from contract services to parts and supplies. Um, to bring that um, more into line. Uh, there's an increased cost of electricity here. The roads budget houses the street lights electricity bill. Um, and there was an increase there for the electricity of 22,000. So our street lights under that budget there uh, is now $522,000 a year um, for our street lights. So that's where it falls. Uh, within our budget. Uh, Ms. Bitter, is a $22,000 increase in the cost of electricity, is that um, on trend with what we've experienced in the past? Uh, we, um, when I knew that the, we heard the rates were going up, we did have an electricity contract that expired in December, so we started looking around. I actually had our municipal energy manager help me with this, and we went back to looking at a, a what quote unquote normal year's usage. Um, and he has extrapolated out these um, proposed uh, uh, increases for us. Uh, so it's based on uh, a normal usage of a year and without the help of our energy manager to, to estimate some of these increases. Just a question on the uh, street lights. Um, my understanding is that street lights along the highway by Walmart. Uh, we actually own and are responsible for them um, and they have been there's been a couple lights that have been down for a couple years now do we have any plans on getting those replaced we're currently working with Fortis to, to, to move them out of our purview and into Fortis's portfolio for the red light like the rest of the lights in town um, there's actually uh, some issues with organizing um, how to do the work on those pieces of equipment and finding parts because they're they're old and not really a current standard. Um, so Fortis is looking on, uh, working on moving that into their portfolio. Okay, so thank you. I, I don't understand how they'd be old. They were just installed like six years ago, seven years ago. Yeah, so we're having problems finding parts. Is that the short length? The short parts, yeah, we have short two missing. They should be paid for by the person that hit it, should they not? Yes. Yeah. Well, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right. I I have a I have a couple of questions. That's for on the roads part. Um. So I see we're like in, in here we're budgeting for six hundred forty thousand in materials and three hundred thousand dollars in contracted services. Um. So less than a million dollars into our roads. Uh, are we going to end up in a situation next year where we uh, run out of basic tar again, or are we reinvent this so that we can actually crack seal the town? Because it's if we if we go another, I, I'm scared of next spring. Um, my street is flowing, um, and I know this whole community, everything's heaving because of the water penetrating it. So I just want to make sure that we have enough budget in here um, to make sure that we can actually crack fill the entire town, not just parts of the entire town. I'd like to know that we have the budget for that. Uh, I, I'm going to reiterate a phrase that we've heard a lot today. This is the same level of service. So um, in contracted services, um, we have uh, on the base level, $261,000. That includes our insurance costs um, and, and there's a, a certain amount of fixed costs in there. So the amount of money that we have to work with is $230,000 approximately in that budget line. That's, uh, there's a, an amount in there to hire a contract operator for the operation of our snow dumps. Um, so they move the snow for us when we need them to kind of create space for our vehicles to get in there and dump. We have some money in there for patch repairs that are related to our utility works. So, um, 
where we do a catch basin repair. We've got, we might toss in some cold mix, but to come in and actually do a, a hot mix fix over top of it, um, there's some money sitting there for that. So uh, $40,000 of that $230,000 booked for that. And for the snow dump operations, there's about $50,000. We have about $45,000 dedicated to line kinking throughout town. $50,000 of that is dedicated to contract stuff with storm repairs. Um, that's if we need to do line locates, if we need to do any third party hydrovacs, because there's some utilities we're not allowed to uh, expose. We have to have somebody third party expose them. And also, if there's any concrete repairs associated with the storm stuff, we don't do that internally. And then there's about 20 grand of contingency in that number. That's if we have any. Board. That's under contract of services. That's under our contract services. So we have $230,000, and that's about the rough break. -up. So, in terms of roads, there's $40,000 worth of third party stuff that's patches. So, and that, that covers any of our winter breaks as well. So, if we have any breaks on our water line or the storm or sanitary in the winter and we have to come in and pop patch it in the spring, that's also covered under that. On our parts and materials and goods and supplies, um, as uh, Ms. Bittner has mentioned, that's mostly electricity costs for the lights. Um, in that budget right now, as it's laid out, we have $185,000 for material supply. So that's about $50,000 for our salt and sand for the year. And then there's about $60,000 dedicated to materials for crack uh, patches, um, crack sealing, um, chip sealing, and cold mix. And that's the materials that we've got allocated to that. There's about $40,000 dedicated to road surfaces and about $15,000 dedicated to pipes and catch basins and $15,000 dedicated to signs. That's our whole budget. and. Um, pretty close to spending most of it this year already. Are we, <clears throat> are we seeing a trend year to year of more road repairs? Like your term say, go back to 2016, was it number earlier? Year to year, are we seeing an increase in road repairs from year to year? Uh, I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's an increase in the amount being spent on it. Um, not no. Is that the question? No, not because if it's if this is the you know to maintain the same level, but I'm just saying, are we seeing a greater need year to year? Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. so um, I don't know if all of you had seen the presentation, but in April or May, Stantec came in and did a, a condition assessment on all of our roads, and if uh, the, the if they out laid out some scenarios for. Uh, how much we spend on maintenance and um, basically the gist of that conversation was if we spent the same amount on just roads as we are right now and this year we dedicated 1.2 million dollars of our capital program to roads and that's not necessarily going to be the case moving into the future uh, at the end of 10 years so 2030 all of our roads would be in worse condition yes. Does that answer your question? Uh, yep. No, that's so, you know, something for council administration's recommendation. I don't know if you council position you was sort of edging towards that, but to look into perhaps an increase in this budget item. Well, I, or, or I don't know if you were edging toward that, perhaps I am uh, in terms of just maintenance. And obviously there's a capital thing, but just maintaining the roads because we can't fix every road you know, over the next four years, but we have to find ways to at least address some of the concerns, just in a patching issue or tarring issue. So if that means that this is, needs to be addressed, then we need to look at that. So, okay, Pat, through to you, I'm looking as personnel and your roads budget, is snow removal included in this budget? We're always moving around. Is yep. snow in here? Okay, well then I'm questioning that last year, we did hardly, it, it did not snow. So where we ran out of money for tarring, we do have money if it's a complete budget. We had a huge savings on snow removal last year. And then uh, just to refresh everyone's uh, memory, last May when they came and said we were failing disasterly 
uh, we're only spending 1.2. The engineering firm said we need to double that. So to answer the questions on the other stuff to Councillor Taylor is yes, we need to budget it because if we continued on the present thing, our roads would fall apart in 10 years. So somewhere along the line, we need to double what we spend on roads in order to maintain without being a disaster. I think it, it's, we're challenged right now. And um, to maintain the same level of service on the roads is not acceptable. Um, we've lost it. the Repsol, the current Repsol place parking lot. You take your kids to hockey or the pool, it's boom, 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 it's gone. That needs to be resurfaced. The roads in town, it's, it has a water problem. The three things that wreck roads, I said it again, water ain't show and ice. And as soon as you let it into your base, it's just gonna destroy your roads. If we do not spend and give the staff the basic budget to complete the maintenance for the year, we are failing this community because we have to put tar on the roads. It's nobody likes another car, I get it. But it's if you think our, if we're only gonna spend 1.2 million in capital. You saw what, what you spent last year, 1.2, that you didn't go very far. Asphalt's not getting cheaper. Price oil's not getting cheaper. And we can't, there's no point in even having public work staff if they, they run out of tar. Like, I, I don't think it's even huge money, but I think we as a council have to get some money in their budget so that they can fix catch basins and they can fix roads and pass those things so that we don't let it get worse. What I, what I don't understand is, so we added $60,000 to the budget last year. What happened in the past? We used to tar, like where did that money go? Uh, we used to do all that sort of stuff and we noticed that this, this work wasn't being done over a couple of years. So we've added 60,000 and I think we need to add more obviously um, because you're absolutely right. If you're not, if we're, if we're not tarring and we're not doing those sorts of things to let that water get in and that's part of the reason uh, we're seeing such huge failures right now is because the wet conditions we had over the last couple of years, uh, we're gonna be, in a really, really rough position. So I certainly would be supportive of a large increase in this area to ensure our staff have the resources necessary um, to do the, the tarring and the patching as uh, as required by Bristol. Thanks, thanks. Um, I kind of re reiterate that same point, uh, but have a question towards it. So what additionally do we need to spend to get the materials? to uh, maintain the roads throughout town as well? Do we have the staff, the current staff level to do that? Or is that something that we can contract out as, as well? Um, I'm not sure what's the most cost-effective way to do this. Um, and how much would that put us towards our, our report card? Um, we have an annual deficit of 1.6 million. I, I don't know if that is encompassing exactly in the budget that you have on the screen, um, or if that's kind of, uh, a variable amount uh, of work? Um, like, is that what we need to just maintain the roads? Um, or what, what is the number that we require to, to just do a complete maintenance program? Are we talking just on the roads? So, so in that, and that's where I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, like, you know, this report card, if that, how, how that is divided out. If, um, you're, if you're looking at the, the report card, the, uh, I think it's, there was, $7 million that was required annually for utility uh, and, and rate supported um, uh, infrastructure. And that's maintaining that. Um, so doing replacements on the existing piping and the existing water services. Um, that is not growth. That is not um, finding new water wells. That is not doing any of those things to expand. That is just maintaining what's in town. And then there's another, I believe it's 2.5 or 2.6 in the, the report. Um, so that's online. You can find it at the Town of Edson webpage. And it's the AMP report, annual, uh, sorry, uh, asset management plan report. Um, there's a, an annual requirement for $2.5 million a year for tax funded um, structure as well. Um, does that answer your question? Um, partly, but just specifically to the road surface and, and the cracks that we're seeing on the roads, what would be um, the additional financial requirement to complete what Councilor Pasushni was kind of alluding to and, and Mayor Zinner as well? What, 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, what I would recommend is that uh, we would be able to bring back some of this information mm -hmm. uh, with some um, certainty um, as far as what, <clears throat> excuse me, what it looks like. We obviously, we know what it looks like right now with the current, but what it looks like to, um, we're hearing, what we're hearing you say is, is as far as um, more preventative maintenance to, um, you know, and address the longevity of the roads that we actually have in place. So I'd like to bring that back uh, for our November 25th uh, when we have more information that we are able to provide. Yeah, can we can we get because we're talking roads, not capital projects, but can we get a um, and I know a bunch of people are in new positions and stuff, but I'd, I'd like to see a number that says we need this to do this. Because to me, we have to give your departments the tools that are required <laughs> To maintain stuff, so so no cap bylaw. There's a revenue stream there, team. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at this report card here, and it says that uh, engine road totals approximately two million six hundred forty-seven thousand, based on a current annual funding of nine hundred sixty thousand. We're falling mm -hmm. short of one million six hundred eighty-seven thousand, just mm -hmm. only on the road network. No, I'm not looking at anything underground or stuff like that. And the council positioning is saying no. Our road network is very bad. It's only going to get worse. So we're falling short this much that we got to do a lot more road work before. And some of our infrastructure underneath is good. And I know we still have paper lines running out there on First Avenue for sewer and everything else and that, which we're going to have to address sooner or later. But I'm just looking at towns also. We're running this 1,687,000 dollars short every year. I can see in 2030 we're going to be 20 million dollars in the hole we got to find. So I believe that we have to put more money back into our road networks, and with that breaks everything else. We have to do other stuff too. All right. <clears throat> Before we move on from. Roads <laughs> under the service changes, you'll see this a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Um, here there is a request to reinstate the sidewalk contract. Uh, many years ago, we, we did have some money set aside every year to do sidewalks. This is a request to reinstate that. That would be a under the service change, it's an increase in, in the current level of service and it would not be funded because it would be ongoing into the future. So um, and then they have also requested ten thousand dollars to go to um, to contribute towards the operations reserve. So is that building new sidewalks or repairing sidewalks? That is repair. Okay, thank you. Repairing sidewalks is very expensive, is it not, Mr. Fisher? Yeah, yeah, that's up pretty quick. Um, basically, we're doing pretty stuff. Now. All right. So shall I shall I move past this one? Uh, just uh, on the signs piece, uh, you mentioned Mr. Fisher, fifteen thousand dollars towards signs. You know, we had a lot of vandalism over the last year. Uh, is that kind of reflective of vandalism of signs or just maintenance of signs? Mostly maintenance at this point. Um, I think uh, we're prioritizing. We're not doing and replacing all of the signs right now because we sort of hit the, the, the limit of what we were funded for that. Um, again, uh, there's a lot of vandalism this year. Um, so it's we're prioritizing the uh, impact systems. We still have those breakaways. Moving away from them. Good. Yeah, so you guys are cementing them in now, right? Uh, the new ones are blue, so yeah. yeah. You want to take a quick 10 minute break? Sure. I'm okay with it. You are breaking. I relinquish the chair to Councillor Byer. Go. Sorry, I jumped down there a little bit. <laughs> That's moving on. This is watching at home, but I just not. <laughs> the two people okay, are watching. Uh, we got three on YouTube. Nice. Double digits. Oh, really? Let's do a big shout out. Okay, sorry, keep going. 
Okay. Can I go ahead and start? Thank you. Moving on to uh, airport. This is another uh, cost shared with the county. At this one is at fifty percent also. Uh, as you can see, looking there isn't really a um, a lot of um, requests or, or corrections done here. Uh, they are requesting under the additional budget request twenty five hundred to start with, uh, getting an operations reserve for the airport. Twenty five hundred only. Oh. Just to deal with things that might pop up. Okay. Yeah. That's an example of a thing that might pop up. Council uh, Taylor's um, snow clearing. Okay. Uh, so, like, if we have a really heavy year, that's the separate budget at the airport and separate equipment for maintaining the runway. Yeah, thank you. What do you mean, separate equipment? Don't we use our equipment there? But when they run the equipment, it's budgeted differently. Snow removal is not included in the airport's annual. Operating budget? Snow removal is included in the operating budget for the airport, yes. but it's just the airport, if yes. that makes sense. And it's yes. a separate piece of equipment that we would use on the other stuff, or the rest of the roads. It's a, a liquid deicer. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other questions on airport? Yes, I shall move on. Yep. engineering department. Uh, last year we had a we received a grant for uh, what's called a maintenance manager, which is an addition to our asset management software, um, like a work order system. So we were successful with that grant, um, and that work is uh, being done right now. So that is the removal of that revenue you see there, um, as well as our municipal energy manager program. Uh, is due to run out in September of this year. So there's a little bit of uh, decreased amount there as well. Uh, under the contracted services, uh, last year we did have 20,000 that was put towards energy projects. It was funded below, as you see, from transfers from reserves. So you see the 20,000 also being removed from the reserves transfers. Uh, the removal of the implementation costs of the maintenance manager program as mentioned. Um, and the obligations column is the, there will be a cost, uh, of course, a cost to maintain that maintenance manager program. So that has been included as well as insurance increase for that. Um, Ms. Spinner, um, for the maintenance manager program, is that the program where um, when something on a road or, or an asset gets repaired or um, the condition changes or something noted on it, it gets into that system. So then, the entire organization would have a broader overview of what's happening? That's correct, okay. yes. So we were looking and it's linked to the asset involved. So you can see the work being done. So it gives us more idea on um, you know, the amount of work being done on a particular asset. Okay. So, um, and within the service changes, there's uh, an extra 10,000 being asked for service changes would be um, addition to the asset management GIS as well. It's an upgrade to the mapping system. Uh, right now, the maps sort of are, are stagnant and give us what we had. This one would be more of an interactive one that would be able to uh, bring better uh, visual aids for our asset management program. And the other one is uh, just a, an ask for external consulting support, so an extra 5,000 to help with um, engineering, our, our projects with engineering. Uh, under the additional budget, uh, there is a um, Request for 20,000 for bridge inspections. This is required every five years. But if you look down to the transfers, I am um, proposing a that that be funded from the infrastructure reserve. So they would have no impact on taxation. Uh, 150,000 you see under the infrastructure reserve. You're wondering, wondering what is that being carried forward? Uh, we had in the budget for 2021 to get our engineering standards. Um, um, a program, uh, a project to get engineering standards updated uh, that wasn't completed in 21, so that's just been carried over to 22. So, any questions on that? Uh, my question is I'm just trying to go through the line 20,000 for bridges. How many bridges do we still own? A lot of them went to culverts. A, a culvert's considered a bridge. Oh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. There's yeah. only one bridge left that I can think of. So it's bridges and culverts with water going through, correct? It is all bridges and culverts. Okay, because that's where I was confused. 20 grand to inspect one bridge? Uh, no, no, there's, okay. there's several, and there's, there's actually one that's in dispute with Alberta transportation in terms of ownership. We'll let them own it. That's, I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, sorry, some of these descriptions may be the financial person's interpretation of. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I'm glad I have uh, my um, my team to the team to back me up here. Are you cost sharing some of that back though, off your expense because you're helping them? No. Good question. So it's twenty thousand that uh, you're putting in there for that. Uh, we were actually putting zero dollars into the annual funding of that. Would that go into the report card we got? Uh, sorry, Councilman, which which amount were you asking about? Well, oh, you're saying you're putting uh, was it twenty thousand dollars in here for budget for inspection every five years? All right, this is a this would be an operational cost. Oh, okay, so, yeah, I'm just looking at this report. Yeah, we have one hundred ninety four thousand, but we're putting zero. And your annual deficits, we've got a deficit of 194,000 for our bridges and culverts. So this is just looking at it. Just looking at it. No, sure. So here's my question is, okay, this is if this gets approved and added into the budget, we're not leave that in every year. And for the years we're not doing the bridge inspections, it goes into reserve to pay for that, help fund that, or some other road maintenance programs. Except taking stuff in and putting it out and just so we have a level of consistency there. Like when I look at this, if we're going to put twenty thousand dollars and we only need to do those inspections every five years, the remaining three years, that money should be going into an operational reserve. Absolutely, and we can look at that too. We can so that when the next five years comes around, the stuff we talked about elections, the same type of um, yeah. thought. That is, that's one of the um, when we look at our three-year plan and those types of things are some of the things that that, that we need to start looking at. And adding to that plan, so we're aware of what's coming up, and mitigate that um, that jump every five years. Yeah. Or we're doing twenty thousand dollars in bridge, bridge expand uh, inspections this year, and then next year is at twenty thousand dollars of sewer line, you know, stuff. For I, I don't know, okay. just a consistent level, so that money is always in the budget. So should we um, re-itemize it as inspection money? And then we can use it for bridges, roads, whatever. That makes more sense. You can look at that different options. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to our um, water department. Uh, across and then looking at the revenues here. Um, the increases you see under the correction and trends are our, our um, operating, just our normal operating cost uh, increases. Under the obligations are those things that we talked about that affect the water department that uh, are an increase that are uh, from external resources. And over on the additional budget is that amount that would be added to our reserve into the future as well for the asset management plan portion of the utility rates. Uh, under the uh, expenses uh, for water, um, there was really just a um, remove some studies, uh, removal of the study and corresponding reserve funding, um, addition of a new ongoing requirement for a hydrologist report, and an increase to insurance and electricity. Uh, under the uh, under the reserves, I have to explain under the, the, um, the capital reserves that transfers to, included in our rates is are some amounts that go to capital reserves that are already built into our water and sewer rates. So for water, there's an amount of 144,000 every year that goes to, at the moment, to the general infrastructure reserve. Uh, and those differences that between that and you see are the amounts that are going to the water asset management reserve. So that's what makes up the, um, the reserve transfers that we have there. So, uh, and at the bottom, you'll see we have the surplus. This is part of the, the revenue offsetting taxation that we spoke about earlier. This is one that is in, uh, internally under our control. So it's, it's lower down the list of priority, I guess, for addressing those. But eventually we would like to see this slowly move out to a reserve in, in the future. 
But as you can see from year from 21 to 22, that, that, that amount has not changed to show that we are at cost recovery for our water, our water operations, plus a little bit of capital transfer um, for 2022. Questions on that? The debenture lease debt charges, that is for, as I was mentioned. Right, thank you, uh, Councillor Taylor. I'll explain now some of those that you will see. Um, with the exception of our uh, debenture for the wastewater treatment plant, uh, other debentures cover local improvements that have come through. So if you look at the very top revenue line, you'll see something called special assessments. You'll see this under water. Um, that was probably there under roads too, but we had to, other things to discuss under roads. And you'll see it under, under the sewer as well. So those are the amounts we collect off taxation from the local improvement bylaws. So these are paid by the um, recipients of that improvement on their taxes and it offsets those costs for us. We generally get a debenture for that over the number of years to have that paid back and then they, they reinvest that for us. Okay. So we on to our sewer system. Um, again, the, the revenue increases there are the same explanations as for water, our increased operational, plus the, uh, the uh, uh, additional budget here. The, uh, sorry, I may just have to confirm with Mike for a moment. Can you remind me of this? Oh, this one, yeah. Yep. Uh, it's uh, 67,100 for the asset management. Uh, increase and 150,000 for gray water contract. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, so we uh, the 217 under the additional budget is for, for those two items addition of uh, gray water sales, also um, some revenue uh, projected for um, receiving of, of septic as well. Um, and 67,000 of that would be the asset management plan in addition to the utility rate. What, what, um, what has been the increase in the degree of water? What, what's driving that? An agreement with a third party that they will buy some of our gray water and return it back to uh, our water pump for treatment. Thank you. I'm going through the rest. There's uh, the, uh, the increases that we have um, really talked about before. Uh, and our transfer to reserves that we have under uh, incorporated within our utility rates at the moment is the we have 300,000 of the 426 you see there going to infrastructure reserve for our capital. Uh, now the other 126 is the uh, combination of the AMP uh, utility rates that you know obviously increases each year as we add to that. The 390,000 is goes to a reserve for the replacement of the wastewater treatment plant when that was um, came online. Uh, we as a town don't uh, we we account for our depreciation, but we do not collect cash for the depreciation. So while it's within our books, we don't actually um, tax for that. It's around probably nearly four million dollars a year for depreciation. Um, when the wastewater plant came on, um, council of the day decided that we would transfer the equivalent into the into the rates to at least start setting up a reserve for future councils. <laughs> they will thank you one day that there has been a, a reserve set up for um, things that need to be done at the wastewater treatment plant, including replacement. So they're the two the two major um, reserves we have there. And again, as you see at the bottom line there. We have uh, reached total cost recovery for operations and some reserve transfers for sewer. Uh, just through to, I guess it would probably be Pat. Um, do we have money set aside to do the inspection of the outflow pipe from the treatment plant to uh, the river, the section that was not replaced? I'm hoping that we can do that in our condition assessment. That's Line in our capital plan next year. Okay, so yeah. part of the capital. But, and if we don't get it with that project, we'll do it with internal forces. Okay, thank you. 
I have no further questions on sewer. Nope. Waste collection. This is a, um, we do our waste collection through an external contractor. Uh, so this is just the uh, adjustment for the contract cost and then an adjustment for the um, charge on the utility bills. 135,000, this is something that uh, is to do with actually do with our landfill. Uh, our landfill is also cost shared with the county at a rate of around 35%. Uh, this 135 is for land for reclamation, and that is not cost share. So in previous years, I've had it moved out separately to keep the cost sharing part contained. But this year, I've moved it back into the landfill, so we have a full idea of the cost of our landfill, and I'll do that behind the scenes and in, in, into the future. So you'll see the 135 coming out of here, but on the next page, you'll see it slotting into the landfill. I think we ought to go out again for a bit. I hope so. Some better. <laughs> You're funny. I'm bringing this cap pile off under your feet. <laughs> I get nothing from your company. Huh? <laughs> you want a copy mug? Yes. Yep. Yeah, well, that's a good start. Conflict of interest. All right. <laughs> I was giving away waste management ones. I just asked for one to copy by you. Uh, so, again, under the contracted services, you'll see that, that 135 coming in. That's just a switch from one to the other. It's, uh, it has no, no impact on um, or any increased in taxation whatsoever. Uh, of course, with everything that, that uh, um, comes in, there's uh, adjustment to cost sharing, as you would have seen with the others as well. I, I, I would decline to mention that earlier. Uh, basically, we're looking at increases to insurance and electricity. Uh, we do have some service change and additional budget requests. Um, request for 18000 a year to rent a bobcat. Uh, the cost shared amount for us would be 11700 And then um, on the additional budget, uh, $10,000 to determine a suitable process for closure of the South Pad and the adjacent land form for that. Again, cost shared uh, to our net probably $6,500. At this time, we have not included any of the costs for the commission that is being discussed. Um, this will be a spring adjustment. We'll bring it to you in the spring. Once when more, more known costs are more finalised, and then we can also bring back a review of the rates at the same time. So that, that you'll see that coming through to you um, in, in the new year. Questions? Um, since we're doing everything on cost recovery, um, I don't know if I didn't ask this question, are we getting closer because they've been upping landfill rates? Are we getting close to cost recovery at the Edson landfill? Uh, at this time, uh, Councilor Chanada, I, I don't believe so. I think I know we have done some adjustments to some fees, but we haven't really done a full review of that at this time. Okay. And we will approach that when, as I say, when we get these known costs that are coming, or you know, the costs and more known <laughs> that are coming from the commission, we can look at that all as a whole. Okay, thanks. Is the uh, rent a uh, bobcat for 15000 is that for a full year or is that six months or whatever? It's a program done through, I believe it's AUMA or RMA. So it's it's a municipal lease program. So it's actually spread out over a term. Mm -hmm. um, and they make sure that that equipment is basically refreshed during that term. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very good thing to know. Okay. That's what I was wondering. It's a good deal or not. So. The, uh, as a part of the landfill rates, uh, previous council would have heard me speak about this. Um, we are going to have a separate rate for our town haulers and they're asking for a year and we gave away a year's worth of revenue so i'm not impressed but anyway we may not on the regional level or the local level local level so we have a lot of haulers that are coming from grand prairie athabasca mm -hmm. you name it because our rates are so cheap these are commercial commercial uh, lots coming so um they're coming in and using our landfill, except we have the expense and we're not generating the revenue off of them as we need to, so. I think the uh, the rate review we're in, intending to do would address some of those um, 
And she's got all deep blue mic and nice tape. So. And uh, just for uh, council's information, what's her life expectancy on this landfill? I believe that the new footprint was designed for 15 years, uh, sort of based on our, our average usage. Um, and we've got a little bit of life left in the emergency cell that we constructed as well. Okay. Um, just point, you're talking the complete area of the landfill or the section that we're using now in that area? The section that we're using there. Right. Because the south, the south pad is the old section. The south pad is, uh, so there's, there's an original land form. The south pad was constructed as an emergency measure um, to buy us time to do approvals and construction of a, a new footprint. Um, so there's there's an old land form. Um, so in the, the additional budget request, there's a request for some money to actually do a scoping study on what's required to close and finalize the existing landform. And then um, the, the south landform and the, the new landform. Because of the wetlands, uh, what we have there now, I don't expect, won't have any room to expand in the future <coughs> because of changing provincial wetlands policies. We'll get right on it. Yeah. All right. What are we going on? We want to recycling. This is another area, so it's a waste collection where we are looking to cover the costs through the utility bills. I will notice under the service changes here, we've put 20,000 uh, also to be recovered through the bills. It's a bit of an estimate on the hazardous um, waste program that uh, has been defunded by the province, uh, and that would result in, in the results in a rate increase for that as well. So those costs when they come in in the Nolan will um, roll up into the utility rates. You see at the bottom line, we are at cost recovery for the our, our recycling contract as well. Any questions? As I know this past term opened up uh, sort of a new like a compost system and a new waste management system. Uh, and it was explored perhaps at the time, I don't maybe know the details, but of a curbside recycling program. And uh, is that something we would like to consider uh, in going forward either this budgetary year or in this term uh, to collect recycling? Once again, I think that's more of a strategic planning. Okay. Uh, matter. I'll just drop a nugget. There. There's a budgetary item. <laughs> yes. And check the name on it. I'm in no conflict. <laughs> Planning. Planning. All right. Okay. We have a few uh, items here to, to go through for sure. Uh, there was uh, under our, the contract of services. There's removal of the aerial photos costs. We did that once a year. And again, from the admin operating reserve, you see that, that counter reserve being removed as well. Uh, there was also in here the uh, some money for an off-site levy review. Uh, that money is being, if you like, moved over to help fund the land use bylaw. That I know has been something from council uh, um, from <laughs> uh, something that council has been uh, wishing and asking for for many years as a review of our land use bylaw. Um, so this budget actually. Um, has all oh, well gone now. <laughs> um, but we have now put into the, this this year's budget for 2022. A two hundred thousand um, dollar land use bylaw review. So that's is, is also included within those contracted services there. Um, down under the transfer from reserves, you will see 
Uh, there was 45,000, which was the original amount we put towards our land use by law. That was not really sufficient for um, the review that we uh, that uh, we've we've learnt we would that we would like to do. So we are proposing to uh, use the revenue sharing to fund that land use by law to the tune of 200,000, so it offsets that expense above. Uh, under the additional budget requests, uh, we are requesting a term position for a person to be that land use bylaw uh, contact for the town, the champion for that. And that would be their job to run this rather than having it, as we've said, you know, on the side of someone's desk and not getting the, um, the attention that maybe it should deserve. Because it is a term position, I'm also suggesting that we fund that from the revenue sharing as well. Because it's not going to be an ongoing position, it's not an addition, uh, addition to uh, the operations going further. And then we have that um, program um, fully funded for us. So any questions on planning? So just uh, for everybody's awareness new to the table, uh, the land use bylaw rewrite has been on the books for four years. We've tried to do it internally. It has been not being able to be done. Uh, it is a massive, massive undertaking, and uh, uh, as a part of the planning, we've decided to go out of house to get it done, uh, much like Gallery County has done and other municipalities. Um, otherwise, it's just not going to get done. And uh, it's been a struggle um, as the current land use bylaw has been amended dozens upon dozens of times and it has become very complex and very hard to work with and there's not a lot of certainty for people looking to do development and uh and for a planning department as well so our hope and our desire is to make this much more easier less complex and at the end of the day uh be more open for business so it's an investment i would say into our future Any further on planning? Yeah, one more. So, Ms. Bittner, so the 200000 allocated for the rewrite for the land use bylaw, that does not include um, the position to do that, the term position? That's correct. That is, that would be um, if we engage to do this for us, that, that term position is, it will be that liaison between that contractor and us okay. and uh, be able to lead that project. Um, and give them information, all that sort of thing, they will be able to be that person who can do that and concentrate on that um, entire project. If the other beverage has anything to add to that? Okay. I think um, Ms. Bitter has captured it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you a question, but not very So the click faster, okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> That's I here or yeah so do we want to break at this point all right let's break uh, for lunch and we'll get back as quickly as possible i still have a specific time just to let people know if they're tuning in uh we will return at 12 30. does that work for you Ms. Bender? Trevor, Trevor, she's going to carry on for two minutes. Oh, you're carrying on? Sorry, I thought yeah. I'm Continue. so sorry. I should have spoken up a little bit. Yeah, no, just two, more, two more items within this particular. Next place now, Steve, I said, we have to turn it back on. He's used to this time. Okay, so. Green light, red light. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, moving on to economic development. Uh, this is one of where, if you remember way, way back when we talked about the executive office, uh, we had uh, an additional position here. We reallocated some funds to create a position for an economic development um, officer. Uh, you see that in that personnel column there. Um, we also did some reallocation of funds from the, the land and uh, subdivision budget, which is coming up next, over to economic development as well. Uh, we do also have an ask under the additional budget requests. Um, we do have a loan program with Community Futures West Yellowhead. They have uh, $300,000 we allocated to them um, 
to, to help businesses um, you know, through COVID to help with economic development within our town for businesses they could have an interest-free loan um, up to $25,000. We extended that interest-free to 12 months. Uh, as it hasn't had a, a lot of traction, um, so we are suggesting that we bring 100,000 of that back and then that would give this, this new department some, some funds to actually do some really good, or start some really good work for us for economic development. I'll hand it over to Councillor uh, CAO Beveridge <laughs> <laughs> to um, newly elected. Uh, thank you, Ms. Baker. Um, so with, uh, with regards to this area, uh, when we speak about um, the areas in which we are challenged um, with, the, with uh, expenses increasing um, and, and really the revenue side of things, when we look at that and we think about, okay, um, what are we able to move forward and try to um, start to offset our, our non-residential, because I understand, um, you know, with this council has already um, established that's a you know part of our strategic plan of from 2017 to 2021. Essentially, that there was was to be some work towards that. And in reviewing, um, you know, of course, the strategic plan that is in place, um, it, it states that prosperity is no accident. And if that's said to be the case, in essence, then there needs to be a clear dedication to resources. Um, the challenge is being. Um, over the past several years, um, there has been there has definitely been work towards it, but it doesn't seem to be hitting um, enough of the mark. In a sense, uh, when we look at our council progress matrix, when you review that within your uh, materials for council orientation, um, there are some key areas that are uh, directly linked to economic development. And as it stands right now, economic development is housed within planning and development. And there's $14,000 allocated to this area. So in recognizing that and looking at, um, you know, it, the, man, the ability to possibly look at a long-term plan for this organization and for the community as a whole, we feel that this is very uh, critical um, for this to, in order to increase our revenues, um, be, able, be able to enhance um, the, in essence, the, the interactions uh, also with our business community and also attract um, businesses to our community. So some of the things that an EDO uh, and economic development officer can do is essentially they can be they become that conduit between the business community. They speak the same language as the developers in, in essence. Um, they increase and enhance that customer service. And you've heard about, um, you'll hear me speak about customer service and the levels of customer service that this organization would want to increase and elevate that. Um, this person becomes a dedicated promoter of the town. And it's not, in essence, um, it's, not, it's not just the, the, the big things, it's also the little things. It's that conduit between uh, West Community, um, West Yellowhead Community Futures. What's happening um, right now, in essence, we don't have a liaison for that person to deal with. Um, and, and the challenge is, is there's some really good strategies that are being brought forward by um, West Yellow and Community Futures. And we just, uh, unfortunately, just don't have the capacity to deal with it, uh, to be able to move forward with some of these um, and create a partnership um, more so um, really understanding what our business community needs. So we're not just talking about uh, new business, we're also talking about current business, we want to make sure that we're, we're listening. Um, one of the exercises that we went through um, very early on in, in my tenure here is, is understanding um, whether or not uh, the small uh, small business loan was, was something that we, A, we wanted to continue with, or B, we wanted to go with a grant. Understanding our business community was critical in that. And unfortunately, internally, we did not have that information. So we leaned heavily on our Chamber of Commerce, we leaned heavily on West Yellow you know, Community Futures. And the challenge it remains is that um, we just, you know, internally, we just don't have the capacity. So with this, um, you know, we've spoken about the land use bylaw rewrite. This person also would be included in that. Economic development and planning development are, are 
you know, in essence, in order to create a be business friendly, we need to understand our community. We need to be able to um, have that conduit. And I've seen this uh, work in, in my, my experience with other municipalities, planning and development and economic development. Um, there's 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 two pieces of that, and we need to make sure we understand what that looks like. And but it's working together, and and that's where it can work the best. So. I guess to to bring this kind of full circle is we you know the recommendation is to make a conscious um, decision to make this intentional uh, to create some long term plans. Um, this is not a short game. This is not something we will see immediate returns within six months, within possibly a year. We might be able to deliver some quick wins. There are some items on our past strategic plan in which we will we'll review during our our twenty twenty two session. We'll be able to understand what this council's vision is. So until we understand what that vision is, um, and and be able to really fully um, review where we want to go as a whole, um, we think that this is a pretty critical position. Um, this is is something where we've seen other organizations um, really flourish, and in in essence is is. Um, increase you know ultimately the goal when we talk about alternate revenue sources when we talk about things uh, the expenses are going up and that is a reality so what do we do on the, a, the revenue side and this is in our view is something that we feel that would be beneficial and we hope the council considers this seriously um, <clears throat> so ceo beverage you just championed everything i had written down on this page uh, my speech was really awe-inspiring, and you just covered all that, and I just stole all my thunder. Um, it, it boils down, and I'll just, it takes money to make money. We are going to have to spend some money here, not just this year, but in the few years to come, to bring businesses to fill the storefronts, to fill Main Street and 2nd and 4th Ave. Businesses that bring families, that will purchase homes, that will build homes and provide revenue streams for us. And unless we spend money here, and as I was, when I went to this page, I was, I was shocked as well at how little was spent here. It, you know, and, and now we need to spend it, especially as we're recovering from COVID now more than ever. We are hitting revenue stream problems. It's not a spending, maybe not a spending problem. It could be a revenue stream problem. We need to bring in more, uh, more families to purchase homes. And if hiring an EDO is, is the way to do that and to coordinate that, and that's what's going to have to happen. So thank you for addressing that ahead of me. Okay, on this economical development person, over the last 30 years, I don't know how many times Edson has done this, failure every time. I know we need to address it by hiring a person. History proves it's not the right thing to do. So during our strategic planning, if we can get the right person to go on the right thing, because history shows it's a waste of money, unless we do it right. Thanks, uh, through to administration. Um, this is something that um, I'm, I'm in favor of. I, I think that uh, Edson has been very um, lucky in the past, uh, and not just Edson, many communities in Alberta where um, that are surrounded by oil and gas. We've had um, natural booms, um, and of course the bus that come along with it. Um, we, we've been fortunate for so many years to have uh, so many businesses come to town or build businesses either in our region or, or right in our town um, and families that have come with that. Um, I think as, as if we want to progress and to diversify our economy, um, I, I think Edson is in an excellent position to do that. We just, we just actually have to do it. We have a double lane highway, we have a railway through our town, we have access to water, we have an airport that can bring in the big planes. Um, we have a lot of assets in our region, uh, or sorry, right in our town, and, and even in our region, and as well as um, the access to the high-speed fiber optic internet. Um, I've, I've heard of communities just outside of Toronto and Edmonton even that don't have access to um, fiber optic high-speed. And unless we do something to attract businesses or to attract people and to promote the, those assets that we have, um, we're never going to be attracting anybody to do it. And I think we have a lot... Um, a lot of great things, and um, this also 
requires collaboration with our county. We're not, I think, in a in a vacuum with this. Um, and and I think that if if we can start to work on some of those things to diversify our region, um, then and and if this is the conduit to do it, then I'm in support of that. So this uh, person would be able to uh, uh, attend trade shows and, and plug ins and opportunities. That I take it. Uh, <clears throat> Council Moore, um, I, I will touch on to be very clear when, when, and if this is something that you know, the council um, believes that is is the right move. Council would be able to set the direction. Council would be able to set the vision as far as what you see you know, as far as being the outcomes. So I think that's, yes, that is definitely something that that person potentially, uh, but it is um, having a professional that understands what the, what it takes uh, to increase and enhance the profile of that Yes, no, you know, over the eight years I've been sitting on here, we've have talked about it and that, and being on community service uh, for that long too. Going to their seminars and listening to other uh, communities uh, wherever that have a development officer, they are doing better. Some aren't, but I guess it depends on who you hire and like you said, what you want them to do, what council wants them to do in that. And I think we have to take on that responsibility to set whatever we want the roles of them to do and that. If we don't, it's gonna go by the wayside again. And, and I think we have to really take a look at doing it. I like the idea that they would perform a dual role and not take on that, just not that, but we said they'd take on another role, rewrite on the bylaws or stuff like that on the normal side limits. So I think we could utilize them in that way. I'd be in favor of, you know, we talk about it and see what we can do and put our heads together and come up with a solid game plan, us with administration giving us their input and also keeping in touch with community futures because they got a lot of history in that with all the other communities all across Alberta and they could tell us what works and what doesn't. And as Chris and I were at the meeting here just a while ago, we actually did touch on that, Nancy did touch on it. And I believe she was going to come and talk to her CEO of Beverage on it too. So it is in the works. And I think, you know, we should keep it going right now and really, really take a look at it and see where we can benefit from it. It's, um, it's just over 1% tax increase. Yeah. Um, I'm not against it. <clears throat> I struggled with DDOs because I have a history of seeing what a lot of them do. Um, you grabbed my attention and you said working with planning because if you don't, it'll fail. It'll fail miserably because that's a big challenge in our community right now. Um, if you can't get a permit, then an ADO is just a waste of money. Um, I would like to see some kind of measures or uh, deliverables or some kind of a matrix of, and I'm sure you've got experience in this, so you, you have that set up because to me, I don't mind spending money if we're going to get a return on investment, but I really struggle spending that kind of money um, to have somebody go to trade shows and try and sell it to some other politician or some other EDO. That, that's not effective use of someone's time. Um, if you, it sounds like you have a plan for it and I'll support that plan, um, but I would like to know what kind of deliverables because and some way that we as a council can measure it um, and see some results. And I understand it's a long game, um, but I, again, I, I, I would need to have some kind of deliverables on it. Just because I've, I've, I, in my history, have seen too many EDOs um, it, it, it's directing them to be aggressively bringing businesses to Etsy. That is, and, and like, you know, that, that'll be part of our direction of strategic planning and part of the plan, but it, it, it's about being that aggressive. It's not just hoping that they come. It's Yeah, it, it, the challenge you always have in a community of our size is, is um, I'm not, I'll never support a tax break because any community that needs a tax break to come there is just there for the tax break. And as soon as it's gone, they're gone. I mean, prime example is Dell in the city of Edmonton. They had a tax break as it was over, poof, they're gone. So that's not the kind of, that's not attracting business to our community. Mm -hmm. um, but working with our planning department to make our zoning and things better, that it is more attractive. And then people go, you know, Edson's the place to do business. It's the hub for the region. I get it. I'm for it, but I, I need to see some kind of deliverables. But uh, you seem to be passionate about it, which I like. So mm -hmm. uh, yes. I'll roll with it. I uh, agree. 
we we have talked about this a long time and, and when we talk about tax increases uh, we haven't had the assessment growth that we need in this community for a number of years and as expenses rise and you don't have that growth and that those costs are borne on on the existing taxpayers we need to drive assessment growth the only way we're going to do that is by having a planning department that is open for business and that we have somebody out there trying to make those connections uh, uh, the provincial government has invested a lot of money in, into economic development and plugging into those um, into those systems, so they know that when they're meeting with um, with the, with the, with the players, they know that Edson has high speed fiber optics. And if somebody's looking to move to rural Alberta, we have opportunities here. Um, we have a lifestyle here that many people will enjoy. We found that with COVID. Uh, people want to get out of the cities and they want to move into rural areas. We've had a lot of people move here. I won't say a lot, but we have some people move here from Vancouver and, and other cities because of the lifestyle they can have here. Um, and I think it's the key, the key piece to this is the right person and somebody that's going to be working with their planning department to uh, knock down barriers to make business successful. So um, I'm very supportive of this. And I think we need to try, we need to invest. Um, and I think that benchmarking and measurables are, are vitally important so we can see three to five years from now, has it had the impact we need? And if not, then it has to be reassessed at that time. Um, Clayton, I think you had your hand up back there. Yeah. I don't want to take up a lot of time here, but I think I, I certainly can appreciate the concerns of council and the comments about how it hasn't worked in the past. The only thing I want to share is that it takes focus and it takes time. Economic development is a, is a marathon, it's not a sprint. As, as, as Christy mentioned, there are some quick wins, but um, all the stories I've heard in my career working with economic development professionals is it's a lot of relationship building and it takes a lot of time to, to see results. So I think what happens often with councils, in my experience, is that they don't see results after the first time they try something, so they quit. You gotta keep at it. You, 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 don't, you don't quit the first time you strike out, you keep swinging until you land it. Um, I'll share one quick story. A uh, previous place I worked, uh, first refinery built in Alberta in I don't know how many years. Um, that was 20 years of work by economic development professionals to land that refinery. And I think it was three different economic development professionals over that 20 years. But they stayed with it, they committed to it, they worked at it, and it resulted in a refinery that generates, I don't know, $30 million of tax revenue here for that municipality. It's a marathon. Um, you got focus, and so that's what council director CEO Beveridge talked about. Um, She's running for county. The plan, the plan, and, 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 and council setting that vision and direction, but you got to stick with it. Um, if you change direction every year, you're not going to get results. Got to stick with it. So, in fairness, can we talk about it in our planning? Because what I'm hearing, we yes. did. You missed it. Yeah. No, <laughs> we had one in August. Made no sense. But my thing is, is where Steve's apartment, because he is advertising and being like that. If you integrated them, I'm going with your sprint idea, where maybe something to join instead of hearing economical development. I think I was quoting the paper was in 1992, the hats off the council. So where I mean it's a failure, we've done it. I appreciate your sprint. We've had comments come back. One of the comments quote unquote, I was quoted in the paper 25 years ago. Their plan was we should get a real alignment company for shopping carts. It was that theater article. So if we can spend the money right, move on there, but past history shows 30 years economical development, Edson doesn't work. If we can integrate it with other Steve's department or engineering and planning, but just a standalone economical development purpose, failure for 30 years. So in our planning session coming up in January, February, this would be a great topic. Let's Make it make sense. And then I would be in favor of money. But if we're going on a crash course we have for 30 years, it makes zero sense. All right. Plan and subdivision. This is the last one within the um, construction planning area. The name of subdivision is the, uh, what the sales of our, our lands. Uh, we generally um, budget for around three lot sales per year and um, it hasn't changed here uh, you'll see the uh, the reduction in the contract services is the we did have these lots with realtors and we had uh, contracts with them in 
case they sold. We haven't really seen much traction there where I moved that over to economic development when those contracts expired. Um, this includes all, all lands like Hillendale or both, I say both commercial and residential. As well. Yes, it's all, all of our land sales. And as you see down the bottom, it's actually um, neutral for taxation. Any monies um, that we may receive through sales goes directly to uh, our reserves. We may have a lot of 70 year supply of residential properties. Depends on the boom. Last year, 70 got sold out in like three years. It all depends what's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, this would promote clean coal, we could explode overnight. Yeah. But instead, he doesn't promote Alberta. We'll just put some more caps in place. Can we sell this land to Quebec and then indirectly fool the federal government that Quebec could sales and sell this and give them a water bottle kind of thing? And they didn't work. All right. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Lunch will return at 12 45. Perfect.